what I'm primarily going to talk about today is actually drug discovery and docking. Uh, I know that I said yesterday that we would talk a little bit about molecular simulation and free energies. I will just touch upon that because I realize this is a much broader and larger concept and you're going to do a lab on this on Thursday. So this is likely more important to you and then Bjorn and Dari will do at least the easy part of free energy simulations this afternoon. I'll come back to the free energy part and simulations in a second. So when I, let's start with this discussion about all these questions and when that's done I can go up and get the lecture notes. We'll take as long as we need here because this is not easy stuff. Let's, yes, you know what, let's start for, uh, let's do the same thing we did yesterday. It's not because I want, it's not because I want to force all of you to answer, but when all of you only answer the questions you know, I'm realizing I get this great ignorant view that, oh, they all know it. So it's much better when I see that there are some things you don't understand or bless it is to you. So Doreenus, let's start. Number one. Right, so transition state is something you need to cross. And do you ever observe any molecule in a transition state? You don't see it, no. but we can do that thing that we can Yes, no, but, but even then, you can never observe it. You can indirectly get information about the transition state with smart things, but you can never directly observe a transition state. Or the probability is epsilon. And in contrast, what's a folding intermediate or an intermediate state? Mm -hmm. But if you compare, if you compare, it's easier than that. What's the folding intermediate compared to a transition state? Uh, I would say, but I'm not sure. I'm guessing that folding intermediate would be like a state in the middle of folding and then. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. But again, if you uh, but a transition state is also something in the middle between folded and unfolded. How is the folding yeah, intermediate? If, right. And why can you see it? Yes. Because it's kind of more stable, so it remains there more time, so you can see it. And by more stable, this is a local minimum in the free energy. It's not the global minimum, but it's a local minimum, and that's the definition of a metastable or intermediate state. Sarah, never, I'll get the, there was a paper jam in the copy this morning, so I'll get, I think, let's go through this, and then I'll have it, I, hopefully it's printing now, so then I can get you the lecture notes from today. Good, so transition versus folding intermediate. Uh, Let's just continue around the table. Arrhenius plots. Um, uh, there are plots that um, they give the folding rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CY axis is uh, a learning rate. And the um, X axis is the one divided by half, uh, temperature. Right. I think this is not just necessarily just folding rates, but it's any rate of a chemical reaction. And normally in simple chemistry, you would only have one curve. But it, when you do this in folding, you typically have what? what? So normally, in a, this is something you can do for any chemical reaction. It's, people use it way long before protein folding. And in a simple chemical reaction, I say you would have one line. And what's the complication with protein folding? Yeah, so that you, you both have folding and unfolding processes, right? Any normal, simple, most simple normal chemical reactions, they are so biased that they will only go in one direction. Say carbon and uh, oh, sorry. If, you if you burn hydrogen or something, right, then you're going to get H2O. You will never have any hydrogen, H2O unburning to form oxygen and hydrogen. 
technically occurred, but the difference in free energy are so gigantic that it's a pretty good approximation that that 100.0% goes in one direction. Protein folding is complicated because the differences in free energy are so small that it's a balanced reaction. And that leads us to question three, chevron plots. Yes. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a denaturant, but the x-axis has to do with how folded versus unfolded you are. And that's typically denaturant. In theory, it could be a temperature too. Uh, and, but same thing on a chevron plot, you also have the logarithm of the following. It's a, in one way, it's a horrible plot that it's less, at least to me, it's less obvious what it actually means. But it turns out that it's much easier to measure. And that's why everybody uses that. You will hardly ever see any Arrhenius plots in proteins. So that, Chevron plots are better for this type of reactions that can go both forwards and backwards. Um, sadly, this would be easy to understand, but proteins aren't easy to understand. So the, the key thing with the Chevron plots measures the total rate of reaction in the sense that the reaction rate, how fast you go to equilibrium. Um, and that, so that's the net effect of both folding and unfolding. And depending on where you are in this uh, plot, you might, you're going to head more towards folding or more towards unfolding. Um, but the whole point is that it's, it's an, so this is measure something efficient. It's much more, it's much easier to measure that in the lab. How does enthalpy vary during folding? Um, it decreases. Hmm? Um, does it ever go up? When? It's, it's like, I remember, when it's like, when it, it's like it can shrink totally, right? So at some, po at some point, if you're, there was, I, I was, in principle, during folding, it doesn't go up. But at some point, of course, if you're plotting the density or something, at some point, you're going to get starting to pushing atoms into each other, and then it will go up. Uh, but during normal folding, it only goes down. Um, I think this is a great example, if you ever ask the question like this. There is no right or wrong answer if you actually explain it properly. You could have said that, yes, it would will eventually go up, but then you'll have to say why it goes up. Uh, how does, in contrast, how does the entropy vary during folding? It also goes down, or is it like kind of less true? Yes. Uh, so there's absolutely no contrast whatsoever. I was trying to fool you two there. And that means what so when both of them go down? You can answer that too. The balance between the two? Right. And, th and that is, sadly, that is what comes back here and everything. That's why, that's why protein folding is so complicated. That's why I have low energy barriers. That's why I have a flux backward and forwards. It's simply a very complicated reaction, much more complicated than simple stuff. Uh, what is the use of apparent folding rates then with the Chevron plots? So the apparent folding rate, well, you can actually measure because folding and unfolding are happening all the time because it's an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in particular, as we're going to see from the next question, this makes it, they're easy to measure and they make it possible to study stability in practice. These phi values then, Sarah, what is in a phi F value for a residue? Mm, isn't it sort of comparing this apparent folding rate between the states, between like the three? Like yes, but well, you don't, you don't compare, Almost. You don't compare strictly the folding rates, but you're getting something from the apparent folding rates that you compare. What is that you're getting? The first step is what you get from the Chevron plot. We're measuring which is, things. Which is the apparent folding rate. Yes. Yeah. So the Chevron plot measures the apparent folding rate, which is a logarithm of k. But normally, we're not particularly interested in 14.5 per second. That would be, yeah. would be what a folding rate would be. So what is that we first try to read from the Chevron plot? Well, focus less on what you want to say and more what I you would say. say more free energy. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, don't be afraid of guessing. There is. <laughs> um, 
so the, the logarithm k is related to the folding through the free energy, right? So k equals a sort of constant, and we never care about those prefactors, multiplied by an exponential related to the free energy. And that means if we take the logarithm of, sorry, so the logarithm of k is related to folding rates. Now we, uh, sorry, to free energies. I can never get the absolute free energies, but I can get free energy differences from this. So the free energies of the transition state relative to the unfolded state. But that is not enough because the phi f value, I need to compare two things here. And what are the two things I'm comparing? Um, well, you're comparing the two states, right? Like, are you trying to observe? So there are two, I, sorry, sorry, I can only calculate free energy differences here. Right. So there must be two free energy differences I'm comparing. And what are those two free energy differences? Well, almost. So I compare the free energy, how stable the transition state is, rather how much, how, much I st how much I change the stability of the transition state compared to how much I change the stability of the folded state. Okay. And that means that, uh, sorry, and that, that's kind of the definition. We'll, we'll stay there for a second. So phi, phi f, just for each residue, it describes whether this residue, how much the residue stabilizes the transition state relative to how much it stabilizes the folded state. But I thought the whole point of it was that you couldn't measure the transition state. No, I can't. Uh, I, can't where, where I can't observe the transition state. But this makes it possible because I'm indirectly observing it. I can calculate, I can't even calculate the absolute barrier, but I can calculate when I move this curve around, I can change, I can, when I mutate say, my alanine to lysine, how much does this change the transition state barrier? And that's, that's that exactly. Uh, we, uh, this was this graph with, two, uh, with the two uh, chevron plots and I was looking at, at dotted differences between them. And I'm well aware that that was a bit complicated. But the really cool thing is how this leads to eight. And that is, well, that's not me, Dorinas. That's you. Mm. How can you then use that phi f value? So this was the stuff Alan first developed. So again, when we don't know what we're looking at, it's good. Take a step back. And what is that originally? Why, why were we looking at all these free energies, right? Because we wanted to understand folding models. And in particular, we were interested in understanding whether this nucleation condensation model made any sense. So the phi value was a smart way of looking at whether residues were part of this transition state, right? Yeah. And we can't observe it. But the key thing with the five values, we can then say, if I change residue 14, if all the stability of this residue affects things already in the transition state, so if it affects the transition state just as much as the final state, if phi is 1, then this residue was part of the transition state. If they did not affect the transition state but only the final state, well, it was a good residue, but it's not the residue that's part of the transition state. So this uh, helps us identify this folding nucleus, sorry, the transition state. That it, it's not trivial, but it's an, I think it's an awesome way. It's one of these, and that's why it, I think this would be Nobel Prize worthy. Like you're using super simple measurements. Well, it's, I mean, you might not think super simple when you sit and interpolate things in these Chevron plots. But come on, you're just measuring efflorescence. It's kind of the cheapest technique you can imagine in any lab. And it enables you to do things that are completely impossible to even do with X-ray crystallography or anything. It's a beautiful experiment. Uh, that I'm not sure how beautiful it is if you're one of those 25 students had to add another 100 points and the plot it. It requires an insane number of experiments. Can I ask a sure. Um, how you're just saying, so does that mean, is it one of those things that like once it's done, you can use it fairly ubiquitously, or will it always have to be a ton of experiments to derive that value for each protein? You will have to keep doing experiments to derive it. But, but the idea here is that, what this allows you to do, for instance, in a protein, uh, like the ones I showed you what, yes, yesterday, is that once you've identified this folding core, you know like what 5, 10 residues form the folding core. And if you now want to start, 
Well, depending on what you want to do, sometimes you actually want to go after and start influencing things in the folic ward. Assuming that, let's say that you made a new drug that's going to be an HIV uh, drug or something. And this is a biological. You only have one problem. This drug either unfolds or folds or something. There's something wrong with the stability of the protein. If you want to change the stability or make it fold faster, you're going to need to modify the transition state. Now you know what five residues you should go after. And then you can, of course, start to do this type of experiments for each residue so you either stabilize or destabilize it. Yes, that will be a lot of experiments. But as you will see later today, that's nothing compared to the overall cost of the drug discovery. On the other hand, conversely, you might be designing a large receptor in an antibody. You're not at all interested. You have a beautiful antibody already. This already folds. It's great. You don't want to, you don't want to destroy it. And in that case, you probably want to stay away from the transition state if you're going to do mutations, right? Whatever you do, you don't want to interfere with how the protein folds. So in many cases, you don't have to redo the experiment. So that depends whether you actually want to start fiddling with the transition state. So we already uh, spoke about the uh, enthalpy-entropy balance. Uh, explain this nucleation condensation thing and how that explains Leventhal's paradox. So let's start with what is the nucleation condensation model? What does it say? So it's the same thing here. I bet it's not the case that you don't know. There are two things. Just looking at those names, you can say something, I bet. Right, so the whole idea is that you first have a, some sort of hydro, hydrophobic collapse, and this hydrophobic collapse, once you collapse, you're going to start having some residue. They can be very far from each other in the sequence, and they start to forming some favorable interactions. That's this folding core. And eventually, you're going to have more and more residues joining this part that grows, just like a crystal in water or something. Um, so it's a model very much taken from physics. We, are other, we also know that we have this enthalpy-entropy barrier balance, right? And the problem is that both the enthalpy and the entropy go down roughly with the number of residues, the first approximation, because that's the size of the uh, number of residues. And that means that you're not really going to get any free energy barrier at all, because if they go sign uh, by the same amount, they cancel each other. What I then argued is that if you look at the very early part when we're forming this, that if you don't really have much of a core yet, the interactions are rather going to be proportional to the area r squared rather than the volume, r cubed. And that means that the energy will not go down quite as quickly in the beginning, but the entropy will go down slightly quicker. And that means that there is going to be a small term that is not proportional to the number of residues, but the number of residues rate roughly to the power of two thirds. And that means that effectively, rather than saying that Leventhal is related to something to the power of n, it's going to be an exponential to the power of n two thirds, to the power of two thirds. Small difference, but that if you keep these laws of very large numbers uh, in mind, that's going to lead to a tremendous reduction of folding time. So the, the, problem with diffu uh, so the problem with diffusion collision is that we don't really have any model for how these interactions or how the entropy should go down, right? You could try to do it. It's just that neither the book nor I have thought about doing it. Uh, I guess in diffusion collision, for a small protein, diffusion collision definitely works. As, a, as you get up to a very large protein, I would find it difficult to explain how the energy or entropy would vary in diffusion collision. Uh, so one problem with diffusion collision, right, that as if you have a, a secondary, sorry, if you have a protein with n secondary structure elements, the number of interactions and the number of ways you can combine this will go up exponentially, exactly, some, e to the power of n. So I, you might be able to, in particular for small proteins, I, you can of course explain it too, but as you get a very large number of residues, I think that's mainly why diffusion collision fails. But it's, remember, this is basically up to you. Uh, it's very, I'm not going to ask this on the exam. Uh, it's happened to me. Once you study physics, occasionally you have these home exams in theoretical physics, which is very fun because you get an exam, you have one week, you can use absolutely any aid you want apart from humans. Uh, 
And then, but occasionally it happens that the professor retracts question four because it's not possible to solve question four, uh, they realized. Uh, and this is a problem. The only thing that we can do with the theory showed that there is a possible pathway that would make it possible to fold with a low free energy barrier here. And if that's the case, nature might use that. You can never prove that there isn't a pathway. So in theory, there might be some large proteins that could fold with the uh, diffusion collision. Isn't it also the diffusion collision model somewhat in depth into the nucleation condensation? Sorry, say that. Uh, then, yeah, the nucleation condensation model, uh, isn't it sort of bigger than the diffusion collision model? Because so you can, uh, the same way that you say that probably there are some key contacts that define the nucleus and then the folding or the for the state expands to the structure, you could also picture this with part of the secondary structure already formed and it's not incompatible. No, of course you can. You can imagine lots of intermediate models. I would argue that the key difference is that diffusion, sorry, diffusion collision is really hierarchical in the sense that you first form the short range interactions. So helices in particular, they're only short range, right? So that all the helical elements would form a helix first. Similar with a beta sheet, they're slightly longer range than helices, but in particular, anti-parallel beta sheets that go up, down, up, down, up, down, you could imagine they form together first. The key the difference with nucleation condensation is that you will have residues that are just in close spatial proximity to each other start forming the core. And there is absolutely no reason whatsoever why they should be close in sequence. And then I started to talk something about the book that does not mention because it wasn't clear when the book was written. Uh, these network models for folding, what does that mean? Yes, and not just saying, the key thing that we've been able to show with simulation is that there are many folding pathways. We can suddenly put flags on them and identify different clusters, no longer hand waving, even for fairly large, fairly large proteins, 50, 60 residues, well, small by biological standards, large by computer standards. We see that they can go through half a dozen different pathways. And that means that you maybe, rather than talking about transition states or one intermediate states, you can start thinking of these intermediate states as hubs or something in this network that proteins that fold well might be proteins that are very easily connected and it's easy to move between these hubs, but now we're getting very close to modern research. Um, yes, you can, you can certainly imagine having different nuclei. I would argue that for most common proteins, and again, this is limited to the proteins people have been able to fold in computers, there appears to be one very dominant pathway in many ways, or at least the dominant the rate critical step is frequently dominant. So you might have lots of different ways that you get to this folding nucleus, but the actual folding nucleus is relatively identical in many cases. You can like completely knock out one folding process like by nutrition for the transport then you might Then you might have the protein folding through some other pathway, yes. So when are proteins thermodynamically versus kinetically stable? And what did we mean by those two concepts again? Yes, and it actually turns out in many cases these two appear to go hand in hand, but it's the whole point. This is the peaks in the free energy landscape, and these are the valleys. Um, so, what is then the roles of these transition states in folding? Yes, both are. So they're both the rate determining in the sense that they can't be too high, then we would never fold. But if they were too low, we would never stabilize the protein either, right? You don't want a protein that's fuzzy and that can go back and forth. I will, I'm going to go up and get those, uh, hopefully the printer should have worked now, so I'll go up and get today's lecture notes for you in one minute. But there's one thing I want you to think about while I do that. Here, I show you two curves. Uh, they're not the most, world's most beautifully drawn curves. But these are two proteins that fold, uh, we can assume. This is the some sort of denatured state, non-folded state, and that is the folded state. So which one of these folds faster and why? Think about that for a minute and I'll go up and get the papers. Which 
ones folding fast. Can you talk about the rate determining step? That it doesn't matter as long as there's one peak that's the same. And it looks like the first peak is somewhere in between. Yeah. So then yeah. that's the rate determining step. The and first one is? And because the starting point and the end point are roughly the same, I think. I guess the starting point is roughly the same. But I guess the second one is a bit so bigger, case, like so relatively so speaking. Yeah. Because of you don't have to read it for the, the yeah, second one's going to be very fast. So, you know, the rate is fast. I just yeah. see the first peak looks sim on the second one, yeah, looks similar the to one. the second peak. Yeah. And so maybe that's the uh, rate determining. But he didn't say, like, the, like, the image, like, I'm demonstrating state, like, I mean, it would go directly to the second low local minimum. And since the local minimum is not necessarily higher, so the difference to reach the state is lower, mm -hmm. so it will fall faster on the second one. I, I think don't know. If we, if we battle. Yeah. Hmm. If we think of just, if we were thinking of like the, the height of each, that's like the thermodynamic mm -hmm. uh, thing, isn't it? Like yeah, the weight of the W is, and mm -hmm. W is the range. But in terms of like when it's the intervals yeah. in kinetics, then that would be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that worked. I'll let you do the state thing so I can't go through that. Okay. Uh, we couldn't agree. You couldn't agree. Battle it out. Okay. That's pretty much how you, that's how you solve most scientific disputes, right? If you violent fight at the conference instead. So let's see, what side, what side won? I think it's the same. Okay, that's one answer. Do we have any other answers? Sorry? The first one is faster. Why is the first one faster? Because the first transition state is a bit um, smaller than compared to the other one. Okay. Let's, let's take votes. Uh, and you have to vote for one alternative. Uh, so who, let's say, who believes that they're at the same speed first? Okay, and two. Who believes that the top one is fa folds faster? And who thinks that the bottom one folds faster? Okay, good. Equally divided. Um, so remember those energy gaps I talked about, right? So here's where we start. This is the unfolded state, and this is the zero energy level. And so if we start here, and you fold here. Now, this is some intermediate state, but intermediate state, remember, folding is not necessarily one dimensional. So this is just some state that we might or might not get stuck in. And of course, in this case, I might have been a bit bad because I showed that you can go in this direction too. So in this case, you might, if we, to first approximation, argue that these are the same speed, you might actually imagine that they are the same speed. I should have drawn that. Uh, the other way of thinking it is that this one, if you start here, well, the barrier here to first approximation, they might be roughly the same. This one can certainly go back. It's a low barrier to go back. And then you start gaining energy here when you go back, right? And then you have to go up here again. On the other hand, the barrier here to go forward is also lower. And then you fall down here. So the way I've drawn them here, they probably are roughly the same speed. But let's think about something else. If this is a real network model or something, this is not just two-dimensionally, but that this is the native state, and this is one state of a thousand, and that is one state of a thousand. What would happen then? So if what I know that this is, of course, a horrible approximation, right? And particularly if you think about those network models in simulation, folding does not progress one way through a single reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate is something that, if you want to describe something as a function of one variable, 
you can think of that as a reaction coordinate. In practice, we don't have it that way, but you're going to have a mesh here. You're going to have billions of states. And if you start here, you might go to this state, but it's not at all obvious that you have to go through this state to get here. So all these might, you might have a billion different states like this of different energies. Mm -hmm. In principle, yes, uh, but that's one of the last slides I brought up last lecture. And then you get into this problem. What happens is that if all these states are connected, what, will happen, what would happen in a case like this is that if you start high and then go lower and then you gradually go lower, in principle that's good, but the only problem is that when you've gone lower, then you will have to rely on the fact that you can go from this lower state directly to your next better state, right? Otherwise, you would need to go back, and going back is now going to be fairly expensive because you need to move uphill. And in that case, if, these, if this had not been one dimensional, if this just had been three different states, then it would be better to go, although it's bad to go uphill, the probability of getting here would be better in the sense because all these higher energy states, they would be bad. You would only have one state that's significantly more stable than the native state. But as I realized, I probably shouldn't have drawn these one-dimensionally. Uh, when they are drawn one-dimensionally, it should be this. The, assuming that the barriers are roughly the same height, they would be roughly the same speed. And this, well, so if you didn't follow me, uh, my ramblings here, the key thing is that this also has to relate with this distribution of energy gaps. The best thing for a fast-folding protein is to have one state that's more stable than the, native, than the unfolded state, while all the bad or misfolded states are higher energy than the unfolded. If some of the misfolded states start to be reasonably good, not quite as good as the folded, but reasonably good, then we will like to fold into them, but we might have to unfold them to get back to the real folded state. And that has to do with this. If I pack my fingers the wrong way, I can't slide them to the right way. I'm going to need to go back and unfold it before I can pack them the right way. So probably when you're reasoning, the second one should be fast. So that, that depends. on Now, they are, if they actually are connected, then they are at the same speed. If these were just different discrete energy levels, the second one would be faster. The way I've drawn them, they would be roughly the same speed. Um, I didn't think about that yesterday night when I drew them. This relates to something else. Many of you have taken the bioinformatics course. And one of the things that surprised us all early on in bioinformatics that well, you've also done a bit of MD, right? So that it seems obvious once you've taken the simple bioinformatics model or something, you realize there might be some errors in it. But then can't you just throw this in a computer, start to energy minimize it and simulate it a bit, and you f should fix up the model? That seems obvious, right? We should be able to improve the models. It doesn't work. And people have tried it for years, and there are even the stories that if you touch the protein, you die, in the sense that if you start to simulate your protein, the result just becomes worse. And that is primarily based on the fact that you always have packing errors. You have side chains packed the wrong way. They're packed this way, but they should be packed that way you're not going to fix that with a short energy minimization or simulation. The only way to fix that in a simulation is to unfold the protein and then refold it again. So that while it might sound great with a bioinformatics and homology model that's almost correct, almost correct does not cut it if there are horrible problems. This all changed some 10 years ago in David Baker's lab because finally they were able to derive some really good homology models. Homology models where you actually had the packing right. And the key difference here, once the packing, once the overall topology of your side chain packing is right, then you are in this final downhill part of the energy landscape, and then it works beautifully to use molecular simulations or refinement to get the last pieces in place. But that will only work on the final end game. It won't pack side chains in a different ways for you. So how should you pack side chains? Nope. I would take, well, this Anton simulations in the US would do it. You should use some sort of Monte Carlo scheme, right? That you've done in the lab. So that try it this way and then try it that way. There are only those two possibilities. There's no, there's no reason to also try it at 300 billion different possibilities when it's unfolded. If you're not sure whether the alanine or the leucine goes on top, try those two possibilities. It's going to take you one millisecond and you're done. Well, slightly more than that if there are combinations. But the key thing, remember, brute force and using the largest computer in the world is not always a solution to the problem. And that is a beautiful connection to what I'm going to talk about today. How are we going to use modeling in general in modern drug design? Um, and this is used in industry. This is used on very large scale, not necessarily the methods you think. They use, I would argue that there is very little MD in use in this field. Uh, 
And in principle, you already mastered quite a few of these steps. Uh, in the bioinformatics course, you probably got to the point where you can take a sequence that you find in a database and try to predict the fold by homology modeling or something, right? And uh, well, you can frequently use a web server for this too today. Um, these servers would actually usually build these side chains automatically for you because if there is an alanine but your sequence has a tryptophan, you're going to need to build in those atoms. It's not a very, building side chains is a surprisingly easy problem. Getting the final parts in place, yes, it might not be trivial, but it's, it's something you can do on a web server in a couple of hours, not very hard. And then you could hopefully energy minimize the structure. You could also simulate the model of this structure, if, assuming that it's really good. And as I told you that if this side chain packing is almost perfect, you can get a beautiful low energy model here. Another alternative could of course be to just fold your protein in a computer. But why don't you try to fold your protein in a computer? Right. Yes, I guess these, the typical target in drug research is not the 50 residue toy protein. <laughs> it's like a 500 residue receptor. There is no way we can fold proteins like that. Second, that this takes you, well, if I, I haven't done this in a long time myself now, my students are much better at it, it will probably take me several hours in an afternoon to dig up the best web servers. Several hours on my laptop or three months in a supercomputer even for a small protein, this is going to be higher quality. So this is how you get a model of a protein structure. Forget about MD or Abinicio. There's this, there used to be this joke on the computational chemistry mailing list a few years ago that there was some Chinese student. You, you, have you gone through what Abinicio prediction is in the bioinformatics course? So Abinicio is basically what you would do in MD, right? Try to predict the fold from the laws of physics. And there was some Chinese student, I think, who asked about this. And, and then somebody said the end of the joke, Abinicio is Latin for doesn't work. <laughs> um, but you know what, as much as we love protein structures, if you're running a, a large pharmaceutical company, you are completely uninterested in protein structure. The only thing that you're interested in, can you design drugs? And what you really want to be able to predict is what drugs bind and what effect do they have? And we're going to need to take a step back there because in some cases it's the same problem, but not always. This is a horrible over approximation of drugs, but this is the classical way of how a drug works. So you have some sort of blob, a target, your protein. This is by no means obvious. You're going to think that this is obvious because I will show you these targets. But Sarah, what's the target for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, isn't it? I have no idea. In the sense that we don't know. It's not that I don't know. Nobody knows. So for most diseases, you don't have an obvious target. And what most companies do, why, why some companies specialize in a class of diseases, is not a coincidence. The company specializes in a class of diseases because they know these targets very well. So they do lots of fundamental research, for instance, in obesity or something. You have an idea what receptors might there be or some proteins that we could target. Um, and then you're going to need to find something to bind to this. If you don't have anything to bind to this, it's going to be very difficult to influence it. And when this drug, whatever it is, binds, hopefully you're going to get the biological response that you like. And you're going to get as few biological responses. You're also going to get a lot of biological responses that you do not like. What we have seen based on very early x-ray studies and more modern document studies is that there is typically an obvious, at least for the simple stuff, there is obviously a very clear shape complementarity between some sort of drug here, sorry, the receptor here and the drug in the middle. Small drug, large receptor. This might, it's one of these things, it's not going to be obvious the first time you look at it, but when people have worked a few years, they start this, oh, that pocket, that small cavity, it's going to be a binding site. And these binding sites are typically also small hydrophobic patches on the surface of a protein. So that's not trivial to identify, but with a bit of training, it's not very hard, neither for a human or a computer. What type of drugs like that do we have? Well, it turns out Roughly one quarter of all targets in the world are G protein coupled receptors. Remember, I might have told you at some point that uh, in the biological section that, you know, what, 50% of all drugs target membrane proteins. That's our usual motivation why membrane proteins are so important. Technically, that's true, but it's a bit of a modification. Um, the modification is that the vast majority of all those things are. G protein coupled receptors. Now, G protein coupled receptors happen to be membrane proteins, but most other membrane proteins are nowhere near as close as important. So there are a very general receptors. There are tons of different types, uh, neurotransmitters, recognition and everything. The dopamine receptor is one example. 
heavily used. The only problem is that until about 10 years ago, there were no structures whatsoever of these. Um, and they, for, a, for a very long time, we thought that we would never be able to determine structures of them. Extremely complicated to crystallize. There are some nuclear receptors. And then there is the third category here, which is my love in life, ion channels. Uh, ion channels is the fastest growing target. Because this is also the problem. If you're going to start a new pharmaceutical company, do you want to run in the same direction as everybody else? Or do you want to find some sort of new, new target that nobody else is working on? And then there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of successfully less important targets. Um, so most pharmaceutical companies tend to focus on this roughly third of it. They might be, but it's also in many cases, we, so the problem, hold on, we know more about these proteins in general. Um, so you can, for ion channel, I know that AstraZeneca, they have a long uh, history of uh, working uh, with pain, uh, and pay, uh, understanding pain. And it turns out that one of the most important receptors of pain is sodium uh, ion channel, ions have well, uh, voltage gated sodium channels. Now, that is one type of problem. We don't know the structure of those yet, but we know lots of structures of other uh, ion channels and everything. And so the company has overall built up a whole lot of competence in ion channels, also ligand-gated channels. So of course, if you are a company and if you have lots of expertise here, you're not suddenly going to go there instead, right? Because what is, your, what is your unique selling proposition? What is your advantage compared to all your competitors? Remember, these companies are sitting in tons of patents and everything. They, they frequently have patents for something that will bind to a receptor, although you're not quite sure how to use this in a drug yet. So that you tend to specialize in your home turf. But yes, in theory, there might be some, there might be, a, I'm sure that there are a couple of drugs worth billions of dollars hiding up here. The only problem is that we don't know what they are yet. There are a couple of different things a drug can do. So normally the, the black line here would be that if nothing really happens, uh, and that's what a receptor would be kind of if it's sleeping or something. And normally, if, if the right thing, the biologically active molecule, would bind to a receptor, you say that you activate it or something, that you get some sort of response. And then there are different things you can do. Um, the easiest thing is usually, can we find a small biological molecule that binds, sorry, a small drug molecule that binds exactly the same way as the neurotransmitter or something? It just activates the receptor. And by adding more of this molecule, we're going to activate the receptor more than it would do naturally. This is called an agonist. Um, and if it's a molecule that does this completely, it's a full agonist. If it's something that's a bit weaker than the body would do, it's a partial agonist. In many cases, the opposite is true, though, that your body might be activating your receptor a bit too much. And if your body activates your receptor too much, you might want to shut off this response. So then you can have you, what you call an inhibitor. An inhibitor might be something that binds in roughly the same size same site, but it just turns off the function. It doesn't really get the channel to open or something. It just blocks the, the real drug from binding there. And for some receptors, you can actually have inverse agonists that you get some other molecule binding, possibly elsewhere. And that has the opposite response, say if increasing a current, it decreases the current instead. All these types of drugs exist in nature. What's the problem here, though, is that this entire picture, sadly, this is the picture that we usually work with. Uh, it's simple, right? I have one receptor. I'm focusing on, say, my ligand-gated ion channel. I have one, maybe two binding sites, maybe an allosteric site. This is already starting to get too complicated. But I focus, what happens if one molecule binds one site? Does it increase or decrease the response? Biology is way more complicated than that. So the second you eat some pill or something, you might hope that this would go into your mouth. It should be digested. It should be, well, if it's a protein, bad things would happen here. But if it's a small compound, it might survive and go up through the brain, blood brain barrier and everything and have some effect here. But the same drug, we're likely going to have lots of side effects, maybe in your joints or something. They're going to be, again, something that's small and hydrophobic is going to bind in more than one place. That's the curse with traditional drugs. Uh, so we, obviously, we, they must bind to the real target. They should buy to as few, any tar as few other targets as possible. We can't, typically it's going to be impossible that it never ever binds to anything. This might sound harsh that why are there so many side effects to new drugs? I would argue there are way more side effects to old drugs. Um, but old drugs are already in the market, so we usually don't pull them off the market. Aspirin, it's an absolutely horrible drug. There is no way aspirin would be approved today. Too many side effects. But if it's been on the market for 100 years, we think that it's harmless. It's super dangerous. 
Um, we must, the compound must survive from administration to the target, but they must be small enough to get to the brain. If this is a protein, it would be digested in your stomach, right? Then you would need to inject it. If you're a company, you hate things that have to be injected because you want to, at some point you want to sell this at 7-Eleven. Uh, otherwise, that's where you're going to make the billions of dollars. And ideally, you should have a slow and steady release of drugs. Patients are bad at taking their pills on time and everything. The problem is the second you take a pill, you're going to get a gigantic initial dose, right? And then the dose goes down exponentially as this is broken down. And that's why the, I would argue the best possible way of administrating a drug is when you can have a patch on your skin. You slowly have it diffusing through your skin. I'm going to talk more about when that when I'm talking about our research next Monday. So there, there is a larger name that you frequently uh, talk about it. And what I haven't even talked about here, at some point you're also going to excrete the, excrete the drug, right? Um, so this is going to interfere with your metabolism and even excretion. And it's also good if the drug does not kill you too much. No, but seriously, that everything is toxic. Water is toxic in uh, too large amounts. So toxicity is always a question of amount and how toxic it is. So this concept is typically called Admetox. Admetox at most pharmaceutical companies is far more of a challenge than getting a compound that binds efficiently to a protein. But I'm not really going to talk about admetox. In particular, I'm not a toxicologist. Remember this when people start talking about docking and screening and everything. Admetox is where most drugs fail. Not because it's getting something to bind is easy. Getting something that doesn't have all the bad things, that's hard. So it turns out, for a very long time, drug, drug development was quite simple. Um, I think I have a slide on that or two, so I'll, I'll come back to that later. There's a classical rule called Lipinski's Rule of Five. It's somewhat related to ADB, but not quite. And that says that, and again, th this, is, this is not a law or anything. This is just based on 100 years of trial and error. What compounds make efficient drugs? And they noted that every single drug known had first low molecular weight, so that it's small enough to be transported, for instance, in your blood or so, or get into the brain. It should be polar enough to get into the bloodstream. So this uh, has to do with the partition coefficient. It should be fewer than five hydrogen bond donors and fewer than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors. And that means that it should be reasonably non-polar so that it can also cross membranes. And this is complicated. So it should be a bit polar and a bit non-polar. It can't be too apolar and it can't be too polar. There were lots of successful drugs this way, but pretty much none the last 20 years. We've exhausted the classical way of doing drug discovery. And one of the reasons is that drugs have side effects, and these side effects are now no longer acceptable to the general public. Which is a bit of a problem, right? Because on the one hand, and I'm, I'm by no means going to stand here and protect uh, and uh, defend big pharma. Big pharma are some, can, in some cases, be some of the nastiest companies in the world. They're not interested in curing people. They're interested in making money. Now, on the other hand, you can argue, given the choice if you're going to make money by selling weapons or make money by curing people, which is better. So from that point of view, if these companies don't make money, they're not into welfare. Because Salt Smith, well, if it's welfare, we could fund it with your tax dollars in the long run, right? So if this is going to be a successful business model, at some point they have to make a profit. And the problem is that we are increasingly putting higher and higher and higher demands that there can't be any side effects. This has to be tested for 20 years before you put it on the market. This ends up as costs. It's going to be more and more expensive to develop drugs. They will fail more and more. And eventually, we're not going to see a whole lot of new drugs. It's easy to blame the companies for it, but it's, we're also certainly part of that equation. Traditional drugs would look like this. And of course, I expect you to know all these drugs. Nasal decongestants, I bet you bought this drug. Uh, you've never heard of these names because these are the chemical, well, in some cases, it's chemical names. And in some cases, they are business names. Uh, the way that the actual drugs are named, that has to do with marketing. Um, so most of these drugs have a chemical name. Losec, or, uh, which is the name of the AstraZeneca blockbuster pill in Sweden, uh, which was then named and pre -Losec. Different markets have different other drugs, and you want your drug to be unique. So in the US, it's called Nexium. That's not the name. It's called omeoprazole, which is the chemical. But that's, it's not called omeoprazole in any market. The common factors of all these drugs is that you have a bunch of fairly rigid, frequently aromatic rings, right? But then you also have a bit of polar things. Uh, so small, relatively rigid molecules, organic, and they're nowhere near the size of a protein. How do you come up with these molecules? 
Uh, well, that's maybe how we do it today. The traditional way is, and I'm not joking here, it's pretty much to go down to Amazonas and look for things. <laughs> So many of the capsicane, for instance, uh, a, it's a target that goes into TRP recept TRPV receptors. That's the burning component in uh, bell peppers or chilies. Small compound like this. Oh, I, I think I've showed you that in my previous slide in the course. The only problem is that we've gradually exhausted those drugs, um, partly because they have side effects and everything. We're not really finding a whole lot of those drugs anymore. Um, even omeprazole was a drug kind of like that, that the first trace we found was a naturally occurring drug, but it was poisonous. You're not going to sell a whole lot of money for a drug that's toxic, right? Um, you might try it either, if you're really smart, we might synthesize something from scratch, but typically you end up with uh, having a trick and idea and a molecule you have identified and try to improve it. It's super common to do what you call a Me Too drug nowadays. Do you know what this is? So assuming here that Sarah's pharmaceutical company has developed an amazing drug. And, well, something like this. Can I just add an ethyl, and you spent 100 billions on this, by the way. Can I just add a methyl group here, and then I start selling my drug too? Now she's going she's gonna to sue me for everything I have, right? And she's going to win. <laughs> um, so adding one small, because you can have a bunch of patterns on the entire composition of the drug and everything. But what if... Couldn't I create the drug? Let's just assume that that's Sarah's drug, and I just happen to have a computer program that predicts, you know what, this drug will bind in exactly the same receptor. It has nothing whatsoever to do with your drug. Profit for me. And I might spend 10 million on this. And then you're going to cry because your company just lost all your sales while I rake home the profit. So Me Too drugs is great, but it's hard to get around. On a typical modern drug, a, a company doesn't take out one patent. You put out a bomb carpet of 1,000 patents on everything from the composition, from the ways of manufacturing the drug, from the way of processing of targeting this receptor. So the whole idea is that I should be terrified of competing with Sarah because I know that the likelihood of me avoiding all, every single one of those 1,000 patents is zero. And if I, happen to, if I happen to intrude on just one of them, I'm dead. Um, you can certainly try to design organic compounds, but what we are more and more getting into is active design. We already talked a little bit about this with peptides and proteins, so I'm going to focus on the simpler stuff here. So modern drug discovery consists roughly of these steps. We need a target, and I'll, you know what, I'll just assume that you've been so smart that you've already identified your targets here. This is based on old traditional research. This is why all pharmaceutical companies run very large bio, biophysics and biochemistry departments. They crystallize proteins themselves. Because if you know the restructure of your receptor, then you can start designing something to fit it. Uh, expensive, but necessary. And then there are a couple of different place, uh, phases. By far the longest phase is what you call preclinical, and that's what we do in this building. So that first you need to start something, find something to start with, a hit. In principle, divine inspiration is, works there. Um, but that's in principle. In practice, it doesn't work because the probability of finding something with divine inspiration is zero. So you're going to need to find something to start with, which was traditional the Amazon. Then you need to ask whether does this have any effect whatsoever. If it doesn't have any effect, it's kind of pointless to continue. This effect is typically going to be low. So then you're going to need to improve this affinity or the efficacy. So the affinity is how hard we bind. The efficacy is how efficient you are, the effect it has biologically. So this is called lead optimization or something. And then you need to start testing this first in small cells in test tubes. Eventually, you're going to start having an animal facility, which we don't have in this building. We have small, we have cell testing facilities here, but not animal testing. That's over at KI. And you can recognize the animal testing facilities, but I'm not going to say how because this is recorded. There, it's a bit sensitive because you know why. Uh, once you get here, your drug is worth nothing. Nobody's interested. Sorry. You might start have some companies that start talking to you, but they're not gonna, it's not worth anything in money. Uh, there are 13 on the dozen of drugs that get here. So at some point, you're going to need to go through phase one studies. Is this f safe in humans? This is where, for instance, with the Tejanero things and other things failed. When things seem to work in some tests and it's safe in humans, that's when a pharmaceutical company will start talking to you. That's when they might be interested in buying your small startup or something. And then you're going to need to see, does this work in humans, which is not at all obvious, right? And eventually, you're going to get to what's called phase three. Does it work better than the previous alternative? In principle, you're not allowed to put something on the market unless it's better than the previous alternative. And 
you surely is not going to make a billion of a drug that is not quite as efficient as aspirin to cure headaches. So then you probably have something that's interesting, right? Because then you could argue that it works better in some sense, in the sense that you have fewer side effects. And in particular, so most and for most simple drugs, we won't accept, we will hardly accept any side effects. Well, that might sound strange because you might think that most drugs have side effects. Well, but yeah, but most drugs have side effects of one patient in 10,000 or 100,000. We are extremely diverse. And these side effects might typically be that you might have a bit of uh, slight increase in blood pressure or something that tiny things compared to what the original disease is. There are a couple of rare exceptions that might be, for instance, um, drugs used in cancer therapy or something where you know that you're going to die unless you get the drug. And then we tend to accept way, way worse side effects. The problem here is that you typically fail. In preclinical stage, 70% of projects fail. And the sad thing is that this is the failure at each rate. In phase one, 40% of them fail. They're not even, there are, there are dangerous side effects in humans. Phase two, it's only 40% of the drugs that appear to have any effect whatsoever once you get here. And this might sound horrible, right? Because you already tested that it had an effect here in a mouse or a monkey or a horse. But 40% of them, they don't have any good effect in humans. In phase three, then it's usually better because here we usually measure so much that if it actually has an effect in humans and we've designed the drug, it is usually better, but at least 40% of them is not better than the previous alternatives. And then roughly 25% fail with when the Food and Drug Administration, they're called different in different countries, are going to prove it. Because for whatever reason that this might, for instance, in Sweden, this might, for instance, be that, well, either it can fail because it's not considered harmless enough, or it's because it's slightly better, but this is just 1% better. What can happen to many companies is that, again, you might have developed a beautiful cancer drug, but this is going to cost $1 million per month for treatment. And then the Swedish Social Serial Center, which is our equivalent of FDA, says, you know what, this is an awesome drug, but it's not worth the cost. So how many patients are going to have $12 million per year to pay out of their pocket? It's not going to happen. So that unless you have somebody who actually can fund this and pay it eventually, you're not going to have any market. So this is hard. And this might say that you want to fail. You really want to fail in drug discovery because the earlier you fail, the cheaper it is to fail. Nobody cares if you fail here. Actually, the pharmaceutical companies don't care at all because they let, nowadays they let the universities handle all this. So this beautiful thing that they love to collaborate with universities, what they are actually saying is, you know what, they much prefer if the university and the taxpayers pays their preclinical research and then they buy the success. One, the one in a hundred company that's successful, they buy roughly here. But Forget about the economy for us. We need to develop drugs, right? And if you, it's much better to find that there is a mistake and there is something horribly bad in the drug here rather than discovering it here. Uh, when I told you about anesthetics, uh, there was a, no, I probably didn't. Uh, I'm gonna, I can tell you that I'm not, but there have been examples where drugs have gone all the way to the market and then they've been pulled after a couple of months on the market. That's where the case where CEOs are fired because you just lost the company billions of dollars. Um, so the cost it take, might take at least 12 years. It's frequently been 15 or 20 years. And do you know how long it uh, patent protection in most of the world is? 20 years. So if you, and then this is probably longer today, if it takes, if you patent it and then it takes you 15 years before you can even put it on the market, you're going to have five years to make money from it. They've even made exceptions to this now. So pharmaceutical companies are allowed five extra years. So you can apply for an extension and get 25 years. But this is why drugs are expensive. You still only have 10 years to make all that money back that you made on the development. And it's th you might have spent, I say, 300 million euro. This is probably higher today. It could be up to a billion or so. So there's a substantial amount of money there. Do you think that companies typically make that type of money of a drug? They do. I, we're going to show you. Not, not always, of course. There are some things that fail, uh, but uh, there are large teams and everything. The successes are awesome. I'll show you some. So what I'm, let's talk a little bit about this uh, go through from the discovery and research on some sort of valid target validation, and then the, what we call high throughput screening, and then a little bit of the preclinical stuff. So we assuming that we have the target, and let's assume that we're preclinical scientists. We now need to find this, hit, and at some point, we're going to try to optimize it. 
This part is nowadays 50% computer-based. The way a, a typical pharmaceutical company works, and this varies a bit within them, that in the old days, all this wasn't, um, by the old days, I mean when I was in your age, this is, in, what you do now is that you have an iteration time that might be four or six weeks. So every four weeks, the team sits down around like a table like you and says, hey, so what are the experimental, what, no, what are the computational results we have? These are the 10 interesting compounds we found for our receptor and everything. And then you sit down and discuss this and decide which one to synthesize. And then you send this off to usually China and have them synthesize. It costs $50,000 per compound or so. Because it's a serious amount of complicated organic chemistry to synthesize one arbitrary molecule that should look a way that you like it. Uh, and then you wait roughly two weeks or so and then you get these compounds back and then you run the tests. And then based on these tests, you now run a, well, in worst case, you're gonna, none of this had any effect whatsoever. And then you're gonna need to start over again. And you just spent half a million dollars in these four weeks, just on these 10 compounds. You can now try 10 new compounds based on those results. The usual outcome is that, of course, you might have found that, you know what, there was one or two of these compounds that appeared to have a very tiny effect. And that, of course, that means that you should probably search more in that direction, right? And you can keep doing this week after week, and every month you spend another half million dollars. At some point, the CEO is probably gonna start to ask you to see some results from this because you cost the company a serious amount of money in addition to your salaries. And this is why you typically use computers for this. So that, can you, come up with, can you come up with smarter ways to test? If we can make smarter predictions and still only synthesize 10 molecules, but get better results for those 10 molecules we synthesize, we can significantly shorten the number of iterations we need and hopefully get better results. So this is why I mean that you kind of ping pong back between the computers that predicts you what to synthesize, synthesize 10 molecules, based on those results you feed it back into the computers and do this over and over and over again. So what you typically need to start with is some sort of hit molecule. Um, today, this typically comes from high throughput screening or something. I'm gonna show you some other things. Um, in principle, in the old days, this was something you found in the Amazons. That is one of Sweden's largest export successes ever. This is omeoprazole, uh, which is what you can take against heart heartburn, and it can also cure ulcers in combination with uh, antibiotics. Originally, this was a completely different molecule that was toxic and you had to, uh, omeprazole existed in two race mates, uh, two versions of the stereochemistry, and then you eventually isolated that and optimized the molecule. But at some point, there was an early lead that people decided was worth going after. Um, and ideally, you should not just have one molecule, you should have a bunch of it, say a dozen or so, from some sort of series molecules that look similar because it means that this appears to be a generally interesting direction to go in. We, it might be possible to optimize this. One way of doing this is what you call HTS, high throughput screening. And high throughput screening is not as fancy as you might think. High throughput screening is basically the equivalent of a chemist doing lots of tests. But nowadays this is typically not a chemist, but a robot. Uh, you might be able to do 150,000 simple tests a day. Now, this assumes that you have some sort of simple assay. That if I have my receptor X, is there a simple way to test whether something binds to my receptor X? If your receptor X is an ion channel, you can do, did you see our patch clamp lab here on floor four? Okay, we can show, I can show that either day or some other time. In principle, you can measure this with, by attaching, uh, putting, well, expressing something in a cell and then putting small glass pipettes on it takes, might take you 30 minutes or so to do very carefully and then measure the currents as you're adding different chemicals. Today you have patch clamp robots that can do this with thousands of cells and automatically test a new cell, new chemical, measure the current, see is there any ion channel current, throw this away, test a new one. It's relatively expensive compared to what we do in a small lab scale, but compared to the cost of synthesizing chemicals, it's nothing, it's less than one euro per cell. So there are all types of different robots optimized for different things that screen through this very quickly. And if you're a pharmaceutical company, you might be screening hundreds of thousands or millions of compounds. Uh, if you're lucky, you might get 10 or 100 leads. And oh, sorry, then the cost might be in the ballpark of $1. The point is, if this was $100 per well, you couldn't screen a million. And if this was $0.01 per well, we wouldn't bother with computers. Then it would be more efficient to do it chemically. Uh, but this still ends up being fairly expensive. You need lots of chemicals. Every single chemical that you're gonna, every single chemical that you need to test here has to be synthesized. 
So you can't sit down and draw random organic compounds because they're going to cost $50,000 each to synthesize and then $1 to test. So here you can only work with a large library. We have that up at SciLab Lab here actually. So we have a library of a couple of hundred thousand compounds that some of them we know might be active, but other ones are just, we have a stock of them. And if you have some receptor that you're interested in, testing all these hundred thousand compounds is reasonably cheap because we already have them manufactured. There is also a large database called Zinc, which stands for Zinc is not commercial. And that's, uh, I think it's a million compounds or so that you can order, they're available commercially. The only problem is that this doesn't work, or at least it shouldn't work. The real space of chemistry molecules is on like 10 to the power of 60, if you look just as a small molecules even. And I, even if you test the probability of finding something, even testing anything that's reasonable, that's it's one in a million or much less, one in a billion probably. You're not going to find anything by searching randomly. Unless you have a receptor that binds virtually everything, but then virtually everything is going to bind to it too. Um, there are a couple of cases though where you have been able to find molecules and I would guess I don't know these receptors uh, specifically, but it might be a receptor where you have an idea of what the natural chemical, the natural agonist looks like and trying to find something similar. So in this case, it was possible to find experimental hits. The first case, not. We haven't been able to find anything with lactamase. You tried a third of a million hits, nothing. And this is what's so frustrating with this business, right? Most things fail, you're not gonna see anything. So there are very few hits in traditional HDS or high throughput screening. Um, it, one question. Yep. So when does this number 10 to the power of 60 for the chemical space? So, so yeah, well, that's a good question. So what people do is that you combine, and this is rough estimates of course, so you think applying this Lipinski's rule of five, you can't go above 500 in molecular weight. And then you also calculate, so what, if you need a recent number of rings, so this should be reasonably rigid. Roughly how many ways are there to combine small chemistry groups? Whether this is 10 to the power of 30, 40, 50, 60, or 10 to the power of 100 is really irrelevant. It's a very large number, uh, and it's, but it's not infinity. Uh, another thing we could do is what you call pharmacophore modeling or QSAR. I'll show you what that is in a second. Um, oh, sorry, I missed up there. This is, um, I'll come back to that slide in a second. So QSAR, do you remember this plot I showed about the meyer overton correlation of anesthetics? So that if you have all these compounds except methoxyfluorane, and, well, let's see, uh, mm -hmm, yes, except methoxyfluorane, and then you, just do a measurement for methoxyfluorane and you read, huh, that's funny. Methoxyfluorane has a partition coefficient that would be close to 1,000. You could probably say without seeing this plot that methoxyfluorane is likely going to be a very efficient anesthetic, right? Because it appears to have similar properties as the other. You can think of this as a series. It's a series of molecules with similar properties, in this case, hydrophobicity. If you're now going to pick new anesthetics, will you pick ones with low partition coefficient or ones with high? You're going to try to go after the ones with high, right? even though you don't know anything about the molecule. So QSAR stands for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship. I even have that, ah, there. Uh, this is much simpler than it sounds. So just make, take all your compounds, make a long list of all the tables. How heavy is it? What is the charge? What is the dipole moment? Uh, what is the surface area? What might the partition coefficient be? How many hydrogen bonds does it, uh, can it form? And then use, use this in a database to try to find other molecules that are similar. So this is kind of bioinformatics, but for chemical molecules, right? Could you imagine what you call that? Chemoinformatics. Uh, it's, a, it's a very broad field. Um, you can even do this in 3D. Um, so this is a molecule where you have, in this case, it's serines and cysteines in blue. They're somewhat similar. Uh, glutamines, um, and they're in the rear. So you can even, if you know what the receptor looks like, you can map out a three-dimensional space and see what small compounds would roughly fit into this shape and pattern. The advantage is that now you're not, you're not doing it, forget about the coordinates, you're not doing anything structurally here, you're just looking at a table with five numbers. It's gonna be, you can screen through 10 to the power of 60 molecules in no time. Well, not no time, but you can screen through and maybe not 10 to the power of 60, it's beginning to 10 to the power, 10 to the power of something that's fairly large because it's fast. So there are some really cool advantages. You can screen through an insanely large chemical database, even if these chemicals haven't been synthesized yet. You can even let a computer program generate new 
compounds that look like your previous compounds. Nobody has even thought of this compound yet. Um, and it does find ligands. The problem is that you're only, for this to work, you're going to need something that all really binds fairly well, right? It's kind of like a homology model. You can find molecules that look like the molecule you already had, but you can't find something if you don't know any molecule that binds. Uh, if the flexible molecules are large, you need to find the way that, well, if there's a molecule with three or four large bonds, I'm going to need to know what this molecule looks like when it's actually binding. It's probably easier to show you this if I show a slide. So if this is my large molecule, I'm going to need to find where is there a polar group here, uh, where there are the potential hydrogen bond partners, where are there aromatic rings here. And then we typically use this in a way to try to describe a very simple pattern that you might say aromatic ring and hydrogen bond donors or whether it's a dipole. So you, rather than describing atoms, you try to describe these properties either in three dimensions, say that there has to be a hydrogen bond donor exactly two, well, roughly 2.5 nanometers from a hydrogen bond acceptor. There has to be two aromatic rings. The molecular weight should be roughly 200. Why would the molecular weight matter? Well, both because of these Lipinski's rules, right? It can't be too heavy. But if this is going to bind as a lock, as, as a key in a lock, it's probably a good idea to have the key fit roughly in the lock. If it's too small, it's gonna, not really going to take up, it's not going to bind well enough in that part. So this is very boring in a way. Um, it kind of works. Um, I say that it works, but it's, it's, rarely, it's rarely perfect. Uh, but you can certainly find lots of similar full agonists or something for a arbitrary receptor. In this case, you might see that most of these, I think, have two aromatic rings in common, right? So and apparently these two rings is one of the common features here. And that's what you can usually find with pharmacophores. So if you have something, pharmacophore modeling or QSAR is a great way to find more things like that. And it might be that you had, remember that you're sitting in this meeting and said you need to find more things to test. You had one out of your 100 compounds that show a little bit of effect. This is an awesome way to find more things that might look like that. The only problem is that it gets complicated. Um, you can start having some, you can start mapping out aromatics, hydrophobicity, you can start mapping out the volume and everything. And in principle, it works, but it's not going to be a revolution. The reason why people use this is that it's fast and because we don't use protein structure. This far, we actually haven't really used protein structure. We're just looking at the structure of the, pharma, of the other small drugs that bind right. So in theory, you could even do this even if we don't have the original receptor structure. But given that this entire course has been about proteins, uh, it seems a bit stupid not to use the structure of the protein. And this is, of course, the reason why those pharmaceutical companies are very interested. Well, for instance, now in cryem, all these pharmaceutical companies want to start new cryem departments and start doing cryem themselves. So getting a structure today, if you're actually going after something as serious about it, you usually want to start with the structure of the target. And that opens another possibility, molecular docking screening or docking. So docking is pretty much exactly the same thing as high throughput screening, but you do it in computers instead. And that's why you actually have a different name called the VHTS, virtual high throughput screening. And in principle, this is very easy. You could do this. In theory, in theory, you could even do this in a simulation, right? Just put your receptor in a box, and then you put a small compound in a box. And then you simulate this for like 10 years. And then you're going to see whether it binds. And then you simulate one more molecule for 10 years. And then you see whether it binds. And the great thing, now you only have 10 to the power of 60 minus 2 molecules remaining. So it's not quite going to work to do this in a simulation. But if we forget about the simulations for a second, this, in general, this is fairly easy. We want to put two molecules together. And you can say that it's even the best ways to put two molecules together. So in some way, we're going to need to quantify what is the best way to put two molecules together. But we also need what are our ways to put two molecules together, right? Um, this is somehow going to be related to energy functions and everything, uh, but we're not really going to use proper data. We, this is just going to be some sort of arbitrary score. I need to say that this is plus 100, which is good, and this is plus 5, which is not as good. And I'm also going to need to find some way of doing this faster than 100 years. 
otherwise this company is not going to survive very long. In some cases it might be possible to do this through pharmacophores and everything, but the problem with pharmacophores they will only find what we already know. So in principle if we know what the docking site is here and what the properties are around the docking site, we would like a computer program to try to place things in this docking site and find something. Let's see, if there's a hydrogen bond do acceptor there and donor there, we would like to match those and we would like to score those well. And here we want something hydrophobic to interact with us. So can we just get a computer to recognize that? We might only need to test a fairly small number of confirmations of this drug just around this site. And if you could do that in a second, then we're in business because then we can start doing lots and lots and lots of these in parallel. Uh, Jens Carlson is a young researcher we recruited here while he has he specializes in docking. He has this really fun slide of showing that he just had a two-year-old daughter at the time and said his two-year-old daughter has daycare sitting and working on that and he's sitting and working working on that. The difference that she's good at that he isn't. Uh, but it's, this is a fairly good summary of docking. This is really what you're doing. Um, and just as a two-year-old, well, the different two-year-olds, they like to succeed one time out of four. And here you might succeed one out of four million or something. You're trying to find something that fits. Uh, so in one way, you're focusing more on the, recept on the structure of the receptor, right? That what parts for this molecule, where on the receptor could we fit this? So you're going to need a crystal structure um, or potentially a homology model to do this. A real X-ray structure is going to be better because it's higher resolution, but in many cases you might not have an alternative. You might have to make do with a homology model. I'm just going to see how we're doing in time, yes. Um, and to formulate this slightly more scientifically than I did in the hand waving, the first part, we're going to need to test lots of confirmations, and this is somehow related to sampling. Sampling in the same way that we talked about entropy and everything. And the second part, this way of deciding which is best, we need some sort of scoring function. So what is a good scoring function? Knows. Sorry? Nobody knows. <laughs> no, I would, uh, that's completely wrong. I, I, th I would say that exactly what, we know exactly what a good scoring function would be. We might not be able to determine it, but what would the best scoring function be? Well, yes or no? One that finds one good compound, right? Because, it's, again, if you're running a pharmaceutical company, what is your goal? Do you want to find the best theoretical anti-HIV drug that nature could make? Or are you happy to just find a really efficient HIV drug? You don't need to find the best. You just need to find something that works. And ideally, well, it would be great if that was number one, but in practice it doesn't have to be number one. If this is, if you can test a billion molecules, if the best, if you, among your one billion molecules, could you rank these among the top 1,000 molecules, there would be something good. It doesn't matter if this is, this could be place 999, that's fine, because the top 1,000 we can send off and synthesize. And then the tax, and then the stockholders are going to be really happy because you now have a new blockbuster drug. The fact that you also made, yes, you would have synthesized 999 bad drugs too at the cost of roughly $50 million. Who cares? That's nothing. Uh, the only problem is that this is hard. This is almost as hard as MD. So even if you take, let's just assume that you have a small molecule here that we can rotate this. We can rotate it in around the XYZ axis. We can translate the drug. And then there are just, there are just four rotating bonds in the molecule. Uh, because these molecules are mostly rigid, but there are four small bonds we want to rotate. If you can sample, say, 100 confirmations per second, even with a fairly uh, coarse sampling here, this would take hundreds of years to finish. So this is not going to work. You can't, you can't test a huge amount of drugs or anything, and you can't test every single possibility. So that, and in this case, it would be it's just 10 angstrom we're, we're spacing, right? The problem with this, of course, is that this would be like sampling all of face space in a simulation. Most of these, comp most of these for instance, if I'm, if I'm starting to place this compound in a place where two atoms are overlapping, I should stop testing. Because if two atoms are overlapping, that will never be good. It's just stupid to keep testing uh, for 10 years there. So what, what you use in docking is not typically simulation or hardly even, well, kind of related to Monte Carlo. But you typically use what you call a genetic algorithm, and this is not this. 
This sounds really fancy, but it's actually very simple. Genetic algorithms just works by mimicking the way natural selection works. So you start by just throw out, say, a thousand random populations of molecules. Throw the molecule in a hundred different places on your on the surface of uh, your protein. And then we see what was the scoring function I had. And then I see, so what were the best confirmations of these 1,000? And maybe pick the 10 best ones. And then I do a mutation in the sense that I'm changing something. I, I might rotate it a bit here or try to place it slightly differently. And then I score this again. Um, so rather than genetic algorithm is just really a fancy name for trial and error. But the difference here is we try to learn from our errors. We go, we do a trial, then we look at the errors, and then we continue sampling in the direction where we appear to be doing well. Yes? Um, but how do you score now? I still didn't understand it. Do you, um, according to the free energy, or what's the lowest? So that's, um, let's see, I think I have a slide on that. Um, but uh, for, now, for now, this is a black box. Assuming that I have some sort of scoring function that, or here you can assume, assuming, here we're talking about the sampling, right? How we're placing things. Assuming that you had a perfect scoring function that if you could just find the best drug and place it in the right place, I would score it perfectly. That's not going to be the case because we're going to have approximate functions. But even assuming that you had a perfect function, it would still be a way, how do we search? So this is primarily based on how do we search and how do we test new positions. Exactly how we score it, that's not known yet. Um, there are other algorithms you can basically try to put part of the molecule or a fragment of the molecule in one position and then try to add more parts to the molecule to try to build this. Um, there are probably another half dozen, if not two dozen algorithms. But the point is that this is not really, it's not extremely scientific in the sense. Um, you're not talking about physics or a distribution or anything. Just test lots of things. If you test smart things, they're going to score very well at the end. And if, well, if they don't score well, you're not particularly interested in it. So this is very much about brute force, testing as many things as you can, but it should be fast, 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 fast. The faster you are in scoring these, the more things you can test. And the more things you can test, the more things you have a chance of seeing. And that brings us to the scoring function, because if you, in theory, you could use an MD simulation to score this, right? But the only problem is you want a free energy. You, just don't, you don't really just want an enthalpy. And an MD simulation, for every single compound, you would need to put it in water, you would need to relax it, you would need to calculate the free energy of binding, which I will explain more later. This would take a week, if not more. So you can't do it. Even forget about free energies, even a simple MD simulation, just relaxing a small protein, you did that in the labs, right? That will take an hour. You can't do that, not if you want to test a thousand per second. And the problem with MD is that there are, there are too many atoms in the system, there are thousands of particles. So that there are a couple of different scoring functions. In principle, you could use something like MD, or the scoring function to MD is what we call this force field, right? So there are docking programs that try to use some sort of physics for terms for Coulomb and van der Waals interactions. You typically ignore the water because there would be too many atoms in the water. Uh, you can have some sort of empirical function that you just give plus one, for instance, if you can form a hydrogen bond. I don't calculate exactly. In an MD simulation, you would calculate what the electrostatic interactors are between all the atoms close to this, right? But you can just say if these two atoms are close enough that they might form a hydrogen bond, plus one. Uh, you can say if two hydrophobic atoms are close to each other, plus one. If a hydrophobic and hydrophilic atoms are close to each other, minus one. So just something very simple. And now I'm starting to throw out a whole lot of the baby with the water, but I might gain speed. And the more speed I have here, the better I'm going to do in screening things. And of course, this is not completely random. That you can tune this so that you reproduce experimental protein ligand complexes. In some cases, we know how molecules are going to bind, right? So you can train this with a computer to make sure that you give good scores to things that should be good and bad scores to things that should be bad. You could also use something called knowledge base. Did you talk about this in bioinformatics? Knowledge based potentials? So this might sound really strange. You can make statistics about favorable interactions and unfavorable interactions. So whether two oxygens, what is the probability of oxygens being close to each other in the protein data bank, an oxygen and a nitrogen or a carbon and carbon? Why on earth would that work? Mm, but it's related to something you know really well. A certain distribution we've talked a lot about in this course. 
Right, so that if you know the Boltzmann distribution, the probability of seeing something is related to what? E to the minus delta F divided by KT, right? So if you just observe what is the probability of seeing something and then take the logarithm of that, so minus RT ln, the probability is related to a free energy. And that's the minus sign Christian forgot on Friday. You typically, there's a name for that, you typically call this the Boltzmann, in, uh, Boltzmann inversion, so that you have some sort of distribution, a set of probabilities, you can invert that to get the free energies, provided you have enough statistics. Because you're gonna need statistics about, you're gonna need exhaustive statistics about every single particle, and that usually doesn't work. We don't have that much statistics. It's also gonna be insanely noisy. Uh, so these knowledge-based potential, occasionally they work, you have to make them very, very smooth, and of course, a, a knowledge-based potential could, for instance, model that hydrophobic things will be close to each other, hydrophilic things will be close to each other, but they will not be close. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic will not be closed. Many docking programs tend to use a combination of all these three. And that might seem even more horrible. So in docking, there is no credit for being proper, well, all these things we talk about, properly reproducing physics, having a correct distribution or something. Forget about it. The only thing that matters in docking is what? Yes, so good things should score well, bad things should score lower, on average. We don't care about individual things. It's horrible from a physics point of view, but it's very nice from a practical point of view. We should take a break uh, fairly soon. Um, but I'll finish the parts on docking here. There are a bunch of ways. You can use grids, for instance, to score this. It's probably easier if I do it. So you can take a small molecule, and I can test this molecule on every single grid point. So rather than calculating interactions, I can start by taking my protein and saying there's this grid point here. We have lots of hydrophobic things, so I'll call this grid point hydrophobic. And these two grid points I can call hydrophilic because there are more hydrophilic residues close to it. And uh, here is another uh, grid point where I'm not sure, hydrogen bond except or whatever. And then when I have my small molecule, I just run this through my entire grid and probe roughly how well does this score. So if you're into horrible approximations, then docking is for you. Uh, and again, that's, it's not by no means that I dislike docking. The advantage is that it's fast, right? And then suddenly you can frequently get these things that you start to take a compound, and the better you place it, you start mapping out what are all the interactions around it, and what is the best way to put a molecule here. And that might take you one second. And that's the beauty of it. Because if this takes you one second, you can try a thousand different poses and you can try a million different molecules. And this might take you a week on a supercomputer at most. And what's happened there now is that computers are now so fast and this works so much better. There are lots of errors in this, but the point is you have to compare this to the amount of errors and mistakes you do when you synthesize molecules chemically, right? So that the whole idea is that when you can try this, you can frequently find something that kind of works. And remember those Lactamase and crusane, things like that, you actually find docking hits. So in this second case where we already knew something about the molecule, we're not going to find quite as many docking hits as experimental hits. But here in the first case, docking helped us to find some things even in a case where we did not find anything experimentally. Now, two hits might not seem like a miracle, right? But the point is you have something. We have two hits to work with. Now you can start developing pharmacophores. You can see, can we improve these hits? If you have zero, so if you, have, if you start with zero hits and then you become 10% better, you're still at zero. So as long as it's zero, you do not have anything to work with. If you just have one hit from docking, you have a starting point, something that you can start improving. Are the hits that you obtain from docking better than the ones that you get experimentally? Doesn't matter, uh, because at this stage, a hit here, and this is a good question, I'll tell you why we don't care. These hits are lousy, but they're not zero. There's something to work with. It's like, oh, I have no idea what's your, it's, like, it's a very small olive branch, or uh, just a rough, you're sitting, you're sitting at the exam and you're filling in the last question, you have absolutely no idea what you're gonna answer, and suddenly, oh, could it possibly be related to the Boltzmann distribution? It likely isn't, but at least you're trying, oh, let's see, can I think about this? And that's what docking is. These are not good, but it's something to start working with. Uh, so that you might still fail, not forget about 5%, you could still fail 99% of the time, but if you're better than chance, we have something to work with. And the reason for that is that the price of computers go down all the time, right? 
What you could do 10 years ago, suddenly we can do at least a thousand fold more. Every 10 years, docking is going to improve by a factor of thousand because of the speed of the computers. The lab results, they might go down a factor two in 10 years. And that's why we're gradually seeing this shift that we're moving more and more from early drug discovery away from the lab and into the computers. It's cheaper to do it in the computers. And if it's cheap, we fail early and we fail cheap. Surprisingly little. So this is one of the fields that 10 years ago with, with a gigantic consumer of computing power, um, I would say it might be in the ballpark of 5 or 10% of Swedish supercomputing time that's used for docking, less than MD. Um, so you still use supercomputers, but you, Jens Carlson, the group up here, they might be using a couple of, uh, they might be using 50 nodes, uh, 1,000 thousand cores or so. This is, it's a substantial amount of computing time, but you have to compare that to $50,000 for synthesizing one chemical, right? It's not cheap, but it's cheaper. And the subscription from Dokken, uh, for example, those five are included in the 126? Or I have no idea. I have no idea. Probably not. Because that these are likely based on chemicals that were similar to some compound this was already binding, while this probably came from the zinc database or some gigantic thing. So they might be similar, but they're likely not going to be identical. We don't know. Um, there are going to be two more slides, and then we'll have a break. There are ways to try to make this slightly better, because to get docking really quick, what you typically do early on, and this is another one of those, you assume that the protein is entirely rigid, and you assume that your molecule is entirely rigid. Do you remember the concept I talked about lock and key, or induced fit and selected fit? These are really concepts that originated in docking. And so the simple early stages, lock and key, just find something that fits perfectly, that's perfectly complementary. Well, it's fast, but it's not very accurate. At some point, you want to start allowing these molecules to be a bit flexible. But the second you allow these molecules to be a bit more flexible, the number of degrees of freedom in the molecule explodes. So it becomes way more expensive. And this is something that's happening more and more now, and that's related to your question, that as, as we now suddenly have a factor of 1,000 more computing power, we frequently use that factor of 1,000 to allow at least this small molecule to be flexible, because then we might be able to make a better prediction. But here you start having a balance. What's more important? Is it more important to screen a factor of 1,000 more molecules, or is it more important that we try to do a better job of scoring the molecules we do screen? And I don't have the answer. It depends. And the awesome thing is, you know, once you've done this, you might have a drug. Um, if you're fine with eating five kilos of medicine per day. Because this has to do with the affinity, right? These are not very good. And if you have something with a very low binding affinity, most of the molecules are not going to bind to your receptor. The way to fix that is by adding more. Because the more, the more product you add in a reaction, the more you're going to put the, the more uh, of the, uh, this compound you add, the more compound you're going to have bound to the receptor. So if you just increase this concentration high enough, whether this is one kilo or five kilo, I don't know. But the point is that these concentrations are probably a million times too low. Oh, sorry, the binding efficiency is a million times too low. So to get anything to happen here, you would need to eat five kilos. I haven't seen a whole lot of these drugs in the pharmacies for some reason. Um, because if you start eating five kilos of something, well, pick any, some, any small semi-toxic organic compound that needs five kilos of it per day. Like it's not going to be good. Uh, you can you can probably go down to any go down to any pharmacy and buy something a cleaning or detergent whatever and start drinking five bottles per day. No, don't do that. Uh, it's dangerous for filming it. Um, it's not going to work. Uh, so that's I think it's a great place to. Be. So we have a lead. We have a good idea here, right? But it's not going to work in practice. It's way too bad. Um, one question. So hmm? It does both. Um, I would argue, in particular nowadays, and uh, for a long time, we people docked anything. You even try to, you can do, you can do f small fragments and literally build. As you were sitting in the binding site, you could actually build it in place. And you know what? It would be great to have a metal group here. I'll add a metal group. It would be great to have a hydrogen bond donor here. I'll add a hydrogen bond donor. That will likely be better from a docking perspective. The only problem is that each of these compounds is going to cost you fifty thousand dollars to test. The other alternative is to work with, but the advantage is that you have all of chemistry space. You can do absolutely anything you want, right? And that's why you can define, hopefully define something with very good affinity. 
What people tend to do today is that you use an, either an existing public database or if you run your own pharmaceutical company, you can have internal libraries. So you have, and again, if you're working with ion channels, your company will have a very large database focused entirely on ion channel drugs. And you're going to have drugs that you've tested before that seem to be interesting, but it didn't work for whatever reason. Those are going to be the first drugs you test again. The advantage with those libraries, and there is, there is one called the Zinc library, and it's nice because it's not commercial, so anybody can order it. We've done it tons of times. And then you pay between $10 and uh, $50 per compound because somebody has already synthesized it. And then, of course, I can test 100 compounds. It's got me $1,000. That's fine. It's nothing compared to the student salary. So that usually it's better to work with, start at least with smaller libraries where it's cheap to get the compounds rather than, again, I wouldn't want a student project that we need 100 compounds and they're going to be $50,000 each because in all likelihood it's going to fail. It fails for the pharmaceutical company too, right? So that we want to fail cheap. So let's start with the cheap stuff and at some point we're going to need to start optimizing and testing. And that leads into what we're going to talk about after the break. Um, let's see, the time is now 10.40. Should we meet here at uh, 10 minutes past 11? Right, so before the break we got to this point that in theory, we have a drug, but it's going to be so inefficient that we would have to eat absurd amounts of it, which will lead to some of other side effects. And this is one of these single things you find. You had a hit, and typically a, a collection of hits, some sort of series. That's what we typically move over into what we call a lead. So that it's slightly a hit is just one thing, but a lead is some general direction that this, this class of molecule actually looks like it's worth pursuing. And the next step is then what you call lead optimization. So now we, we would like to get this down from, we would like to improve the affinity. And this affinity is typically measured in uh, concentration, um, which is really the concentration you need to get, say, 50% effect or something in a binding assay, right? And initially, this might be millimolar or, well, millimolar is probably what you're going to see. Not particularly efficient. A really outstanding drug would have picomolar affinity. So they're talking about a billion times better. And the way you're going to do this is you, today you do a whole lot of it with computational chemistry. You might need to determine an X-ray structure, not just of your receptor, but of your receptor in complex, which you drug to see exactly how it binds, to see can I improve the drug based on this structure. It would be awesome if I also had a hydrogen bond donor here right next to this ring. And then you try to add one and see if it improves. Uh, so you need to understand binding really well, and then you need to gradually refine this, and this is typically where you have this four to six week iteration. You have something that works, but you're trying to get it better. And hopefully, well, even if you're the lead of such a team, you're going to have some sort of boss above you, right? And he ex likely expects you to see that week by week, the affinity, well, the affinity improves in the sense that you, the concentration you need goes down. At some point, if this concentration no longer goes down, what's going to happen? Well, they get tired of spending half a million per month for your chemicals, so they're going to close the project. And if you're lucky, you can move over to another project. And what eventually happened, it's uh, AstraZeneca in Södertälje, south of Stockholm. So they had focused on a very broad area of research, and eventually the company started to feel, you know what, we've been investing in 15 years, and there haven't really been any new blockbuster drugs in this area. And eventually the company decided to pull out of that particular area. And then you close an entire facility and a thousand people go out, go unemployed. That happens. Of course, they open lots of new facilities too, right? Um, and ideally, you want molecules that are easier to synthesize and hopefully not too poisonous. And this might be strange because you, we can, we're frequently able to fix this. This is what's happened with omeprazole. You eventually found a way to cut the molecule in two halves. And when you only had half the molecule, it was no longer toxic. This is a great example. This was actually one of the first computer designed drugs or computer refined drug, HIV-1 protease, which is one of the first anti-HIV drugs. So let's see if I remember this correctly. So that you started out, this is a diol. So you started out with a symmetric drug that had some sort of activity. And then from that drug, you created a very simple pharmacophore that you needed a hydrogen bond donor or acceptor here in the middle. You had some distances and then you had these two phosphate groups at a distance of roughly 8 to 12 angstrom. Super simple pharmacophore, right? And then you started screening databases and started to find lots of things like it, in particular that hit um, that you then test and you realize that this appears to work. Um, 
eventually you end up with a slightly different design. This is not that much smaller, so you have a phosphates here too, so it's a slightly larger drug than it might appear there. And uh, then you extended this drug to make a diol, make it slightly larger, uh, two alcohol groups. Um, you added a uh, urea part to it here. Don't ask me why. It was likely good in some testing. Eventually, they started to optimize the stereochemistry of it so that it would bind more efficiently. And after a bunch of, this, and again, this is an extreme summary. They probably went through 100 iterations, right? And this is the drug they eventually selected for phase one studies. And this is used clinically today. When was this oh, it's a good question. It's probably 10 or 15 years ago. 15 years. This was big when it first appeared. Today, this is how you develop all drugs. Um, there is a big group in, uh, in the US at uh, Yale University, by, led by Bill Jorgensen, and they're really the world experts of optimizing these drugs. He spent his entire career on give him, give him a millimolar drug, and they will get a picomolar version of it. Frequently, they do this with MD, but I will have to come back to that on Monday. Um, because in principle, once you have something that's fairly good, we might be able to start calculating very specifically, in particular, improving the binding energy or something. This is a drug developed that way. Do you know what this is? Atorvastatin. So it's a statin that you use against high cholesterol, basically. Uh, you probably never heard of that name, right? No, that atorvastatin. No. So it's also known as Lipitor. This is the best-selling drug in the history of mankind. Remember how, uh, how much I said it cost you to develop a drug? Yes, ballpark. Do you know how much this is sold for? 150 billion dollars. So there is a reason why they're spending 500 million. But of course, for every drug like this, right, there are going to be a thousand that failed. Um, hopefully not all failures cost 500 million. So the whole idea that the way you think that running a pharmaceutical company is almost like playing the lottery. Once you get here, you want these drugs, of course, right? But you're well known, you, you're not going to win on the lottery every time. So the whole point, can you reduce the price of the ticket on which you don't win? And therefore, you want to fail early. You, you will fail at least 999 times of 1,000. But the earlier you fail, the lower the price for the non-winning tickets are. It's not a problem that this cost a billion to develop because they made 149 billions. Um, but of course, now this revenue is gradually going down. Why is the revenue going down? It's going down quite rapidly. Patent ran out. So suddenly anybody can make it and sell it for a tenth of the cost. And of course, then the original manufacturer has to reduce the price to the same amount. Otherwise, would nobody would buy the original drug. It is, and, and again, I, that's, that's, that's the way patents work, right? Um, the, the reason we award patents to companies is not because we care deeply about companies. You get a patent, but what is, in return for getting a patent, it's something that you have to do. What is that you have to do? No, but it's, uh, it's because it's public, right? So when you get a patent, you have to describe exactly what you did. And 20 years later, that is publicly available. Anybody can take your patent and copy it. So that's this, it's, it's not a terror balance, but it's a balance between the interests of the public that this has to be made publicly available, but in return for making this publicly available, you get a unique right to it for 20 years. In theory, you could have decided to keep it a secret instead. Although then somebody would probably try to synthesize the pill. But based on what you knew, it seems obvious. Can't we just use molecular simulations, much better force fields than discovered drugs, right? There is a surprising, and um, I think this is a very, Let's be politically clear. It's not the world's greatest idea, if I might say so. You're going to see a bunch of simulations here just because people have done it. And you had this David Shaw and these Anton machines, right, in New York. Um, this is one example of a protein. And here you have a small molecule just out in the water. And they run this for several microseconds. So they average the shape of the protein. The protein starts binding there. I think the actual binding pocket is going to be in here. The drug didn't like that. And then it's starting to find out somewhere there it's actually found the correct binding post. The cost of this is astronomic because you need, you can only do this for one drug. It probably took several weeks on one of those Anton machines. Long term, on the other hand, 
There was a day when people ran simulations like the ones you did on the labs and it took months and it was completely pointless. As absurd as I might think that this is now, there might be a future probably in your lifetimes where this might very well become so cheap that it's just as, just as cheap as docking and then there's no point in using docking anymore. So it's, it's always dangerous to mock things. And I, I would mock this. I said, this is not how you should develop a drug. But keep in mind, if computers are suddenly a million times faster, because again, I might not know exactly where the binding site is, right? And the simulation does that, find that for me. Now, the beautiful thing with this is that the, day, the second you have a simulation, you can start plotting out what are all the interaction energies. And if we have enough of these interaction energies, we should even be able to derive some sort of free energy. Because that's the problem here. Uh, getting interaction energies, Coulomb, Lena, Jones, electrostatics, the enthalpy, that's trivial. We calculate them in the simulation, right? So I just need to store them to disk and see what they are. What is that I don't get in the simulation? Entropy, right? So that the only way, there are a bunch of different ways. I could, I could of course, start talking about probabilities. What is the probability of seeing the molecule there? If I just collect enough probabilities, then I could invert the Boltzmann distribution and say what the free energy is, right? That would work. I could also take this molecule, if I know where it's binding, I could try to gradually pull this molecule out, do the work. As long as I measure how much I'm pulling with it on the force, I'm literally measuring the exact work I have to do on the system to get the molecule to unbind. I would need to do this very slowly or there would be noise and hysteresis effects. But in theory, if I do work on a system, as long as I know how much work I had to put into the system, I know how much free energy it took to change it. Because work corresponds to free energy. In some cases, it turns out that you can do really smart things alchemically. So I can remove an, add or remove an ethyl or methyl group. In principle, that's just related to differences in free energy. But there's going to be one problem here that Bjorn and Dari will show you at the lab today. And what is that? So this is not entirely easy, but assuming that you have a mountain and that you're scaling a mountain. And when you start at the foot of the mountain or something, we start measuring how much, how much, the, uh, how much I go up. Say I, I, went, I just went up one meter. It's fairly easy to estimate, right? And if this mountain now corresponds to a free energy, as long as I'm in the valley, it's easy. I'm going to explore the valley really well, and I will explore the relative height of the valley beautifully. Now, it's also very easy to move to the next valley by car or whatever, or magic. And I can also explore the next valley. But I will never explore the peak. So what is the height of valley A versus the height of valley B? I know all the relative heights in valley A, and I know all the relative heights in valley B, but how are these valleys related to each other? I will not be able to say that unless I have the heights, the relative heights also at the peak of the mountain, right? And it's very expensive to be at the peak of the mountain. So that to actually calculate free energies efficiently in a simulation, I need to find a way to also study all the bad conformations between the good conformations. Bjorn and Ari will show you that in a simple example today. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we do that in practice in the simulations. The good thing that in theory, when this works well, molecular dynamic simulations can be awesome. They are expensive, mind you. But so this is an experiment. This is a protein called FK. FK, FK501 binding protein, doesn't matter what it does. Experimental inhibition constants, calculated ones. So the error here is less than half a kilocalorie per mole. You can predict binding. Each of these simulations might take you a day or something. There are some very large pharmaceutical companies in the world, and I can't tell you which ones they are, but using some of the largest supercomputers in the world and trying to explore this. This is still on the research level. So why do they do this? It's like it's a thousand times more expensive than docking. Well, you might be able to get things you can't do in docking, right? But you can say that you want to design a specifically design an antibody or something, doing things that are really complicated, much larger molecules that are too complicated to do with docking. And again, 10 years from now on, they're well aware, they're not stupid, they're well aware that these computers are too expensive to use in production. But 10 years from now, that computer, which is currently the largest one in the world, you're going to have in your pocket, the equivalent of now the flops. And I'm not actually, no, it's going to be slightly more than 10 years. 1996, the largest computers in the world had the power of an iPhone today. 
1996 was the year I started graduate school. So that's where you are now. So that the very largest machines in the world today, by the time you're out all the time, you're going to have them in your pocket. And then, of course, this will likely suddenly be a very attractive alternative. So that to be able to get your patents, to be able to go there, to be able to have the expertise, the research has to precede the actual practice by one or two decades. Um, there are lots of things you could do there. You could, for instance, figure out what happens if you have a molecule here that's going to rotate in two different ways, or if the entire molecule is rotated, right? Some of these things can be really hard to get in docking. Um, if you're smart, you can do it, but there are, even today, there are some things that simulations just can't do better, but they're still the exception rather than the rule. Had you asked me 10 years ago, I said you're completely crazy if you try to apply simulations in drug discovery. Today, it's starting to happen. In uh, 10 years, I would guess that it's going to be common. We have, and I think that's all I'm going to say about docking. I'm going to move over to slightly more the part we actually use docking for, GPCRs. So why did I include GPCRs in this lecture rather than the membrane protein lecture? They're by far the biggest docking target, right? That when we think GPCRs, we think docking. Uh, there are seven transmembrane segment proteins, which is kind of fun because that's similar to the very first membrane protein that was determined. Do you remember which one that was? Rhodopsin, bacterial rhodopsin. The same class of proteins, and the scary thing, if you just look at them superficially, you couldn't tell it's from rhodopsin. That's so stupid. So why didn't we just make an homology model on rhodopsin then and solve the entire problem? Well, we know what we had a structure of rhodopsin, right? So why, why didn't we just make an homology model of these? They are homologous. So the problem is that they're relatively distant in sequence. The other problem is that you're going to have things binding up here right among all the loops, and these loops are completely different. So that while they look the same, seen from a distance, the binding sites are being completely different. There is no way. The sad thing is that you're going to make something that superficially looks the same at screen, but you're going to have the geometry of the binding site be completely different. So you're not going to be able to predict any binding there. Some of the, there were these, I'm, I'm, I don't know this, but there were rumors that some of, before that, that first structure became available, pharmaceutical companies spent in the order of $2 billion to try to get structures of the protein coupled receptors. And I do know that some of the very, when the first group started discovering structures, only some of them were public because they were supported by the pharmaceutical companies. So they, I think they released four structures publicly, but one structure was withheld for a year due to a collaboration with a pharmaceutical company. So that company had a one-year head start on the structure, which they probably paid a lot of money for. Uh, this number is about a year or two old, so it's probably 30 years. This has grown tremendously. Um, and the reason why they're important is that they're involved in all these fun signaling pathways and everything. It's a myriad of things. What happens is that you have something binding on the outside, Magic happens that some of these helices move a bit, and this results in a signal here on the inside that something is released. This structure, the first real X-ray structure, was published in November 2007. Do you see something with those two dates? It was a fierce battle here. Uh, and there were even some, there have been some major conflicts between these groups. Uh, now, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I did my postdoc at the department of Stanford where Brian worked too, so I'm somewhat <laughs> biased here. Uh, Brian is a super nice guy, and I'm very happy that he got the Nobel Prize. Stephen, Ray Stevens is also an amazing scientist, and they have a huge uh, operation at Scripps where they have mapped out entirely. The funny thing is Brian still argues that he doesn't work with uh, GPCR. He just works with the human beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which is a very one specific GPCR. Uh, some of these structures, nowadays we actually have co-crystals where we see exactly where carazolol, um, which is one small drug candidate, actually binds to this re uh, receptor. And uh, at least experimentally, we have a rough idea how it might work that the receptor would somehow relax due to this binding and change the position of one helix. There has been a complete dis explosion in the number of structures available. Uh, so nowadays we have structures of the, both the relaxed and the active states. We have re receptor structures with the complex, including the G protein. And we even have an NMR structure. And there, I think there are some cryogenic structures in the pipeline too. And this somehow explodes there again. 
2007 is not that long ago, right? The bovine rhodopsin was a simple, that wasn't, that wasn't bacterial rhodopsin, but it wasn't really until 2007 this field started, nine years ago. They didn't go from, but Boeing was a completely different receptor. Uh, but, uh, the problem with, remember what I said about membrane proteins, that eukaryotic membrane proteins in general, they're floppy, they're hard to stabilize, they're very flexible, they don't overexpress well. So people, actually the crystallography part is trivial, but getting the protein to be overexpressed, being able to purify it, and then making sure that it actually crystallizes was a tremendous effort. And had you asked me 10 years ago, I would say that's one of those things I likely won't see it in my lifetime. There were several groups ready to give up that that won't ever happen. People have talked about it for 20 years. And then suddenly, almost from one year to another, which of course, Brian had worked in this way more than a year, right? But suddenly they cracked it. Sadly, he got the Nobel Prize way too soon because we can't, well, I love Brian, he's a nice guy, but he kept coming here and give lectures <laughs> and everything. We would have loved to keep him, keep him on, the, on the hook for 10 year, more years. Um, and as we also have all these different structures of different activated and intermediate states, which means that we actually now start to say something about what happens when we bind. Uh, Ron Dror, in particular of David Shaw, has done simulations of that too. Also long simulation. So here you get the small, I think it's carousel here too, binding. It's going to bind up here. And in the binds here, it will, you hardly see it here. It would actually push the helix a bit out and then cause the structure. You see that you push the helix out, the molecule get further down and this is going to lead to a structural reorientation that uh, leads to a change here on the inside. I'll show you more about that in a second. We know a lot of this binding site now and Jens Carlson in, our, in uh, the department up here in particular, they have been one of the leading groups that using these structures now to try to dock things. So I think this is an example from a, a project they did together with Ron Rohr. The gray part here is what you had in the x-ray structure. If you use not the x-ray structure, but an x-ray structure of an unbound uh, receptor, and then you try to do this in a simulation, you end up with the pink one. Pretty decent fit, right? So that while there are certainly things that can go wrong and everything, but if we can just sample this enough, we can get some awesome binding predictions. And this is, of course, just a test. As in this case, we know how the molecule binds, but if this is fast enough, you could imagine doing this for a 1,000 molecules. The problem is that these things take huge amounts of time in a simulation. Um, if you just see here, the number of waters around the ligand or something, eventually you're in the unbound state here, then eventually you go down and eventually get to the blue part here that's bound, and you probably can't see the time scale here, but it's, this runs out to four microseconds. Compare this with the length of your simulations. And this was even slightly faster than I thought it would have been. But eventually you get it binding all the way down. This is not something you would do today if you need to design a drug. But since we got to the point where we really understand the properties of the binding site, Jens in particular, they've been extremely successful at running high throughput virtual screening, docking, and predict how new molecules bind. And there are a number of competitions, GPCR doc, for instance, and the, these are academic competitions. But the idea is that when a new group has co-crystallized something, they give people like Jens a chance to that six, they say, you know, in three months we will publish what the structure is. But I can tell you already now that the compound we have is, for instance, alprenolol, and we've docked this to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Have a go at predicting it. And the whole thing is that you predict it before you know what the result is, and then three months later you will see what the results were, and then you can see. There is this funny thing in science. For whatever reason, it's much easier to post-predict than predict. So once we know what the result is, we do much better than if we actually do real blind prediction. And that comes back to the whole protein folding problem too. There were a bunch of people that claimed that they had solved protein folding until they actually were asked to predict proteins for which we didn't know the structure and then they failed for some reason. And it's not because scientists cheat, right? But you, we fool ourselves to think that we understand the problem. It's harder in practice. Right? Yes, that's CASP. Um, and there is a very large competition called Capri2, which has to do with protein-protein interactions. Uh, CASP has been so successful, I think that CASP set the model for all these other, and they're not really competitions there. We call them assessments, but of course everybody knows that it's a competition. Uh, in particular, if you win, then it's a competition. If you lose, it was an experiment. And I think this is a, just a second barrier where they're showing how, in this case, that the alpinol, this has to do with actually phenylalanine side chains flipping around to eventually make it possible for the molecule to move down. I won't go into too much details about that. Uh, 
The neat thing that you can do with simulations though, that you can't just do with docking, suddenly we can start to correlate things with lots of different types of compounds and everything. Uh, we can use, in turn, use docking results to see that different compounds, and let's see, yes, different, com uh, different compounds in complex with different receptors. What interact, what residues do you typically interact with? Are there patterns here? So in this case, yes, there appear to be some pattern, right? That one class of aminergic compounds here tend to form very nice complexes that involve certain residues here. So there's a lot of statistics you can do here too. And this is, again, this is sort of a mix between chemoinformatics and bioinformatics that you use a lot in docking too. The point here is that the goal in all these things is to find things that bind. If you can find things that bind, it's good. It doesn't really matter how you do it. And because that's a, it's a fairly fuzzy problem, right? Uh, that means that there are lots of openings for just being smart. In general, by the time you have 30 different GPCRs and you have 30 different docking results, you can start doing statistics of it. In general, what type of compounds do usually well bind well to GPCRs? There are also different binding sites. This is a bit related to these allosteric modulation I talked about. Um, and here you're going to see a larger molecule binding to the site and it will eventually squeeze its way down too. So here there are two different binding sites. And what Ron and Al said, this was a fairly short simulation, 10 microseconds. I think they went up to 20. But what they've been able to show in simulations too that you cannot show in docking, is that they've shown how the activation works. So the way a G protein coupled receptor activates is you have an agonist and that's bind. What did an agonist do again? It, yeah, or rather it creates the same type of signal. That's a bit, an agonist creates the same type of signal as the natural ligand would do. When you say amplify, that would rather be something else. So when you say amplify, that would be an allosteric modulator, right? That you would still have the original molecule bind here, but the allosteric molecule binds elsewhere and just amplifies the effect. So the agonist is a different molecule that has the same effect, and this causes some magic to happen in here. So something changes in the helices that causes this to release a molecule or something on the inside, and then this molecule would diffuse on the inside and tell the cell to do something, and there are a whole range of different signals here. So what Brian Kobilka in particular managed to do, they managed to determine the complex of this molecule a few years after the first one. So you have both the G protein coupled receptor and the G protein itself. And then we know the complex between these receptors. And then the only question is, is how do you create this initial conformational change? And for a long time, we didn't really know that. So there were some guesses and everything. Um, but what people were eventually able to do is that uh, Ron Dror and others were able to show with these long simulations, Anton, I'm not sure where I have a movie of that, that this has to do with one of these long helices in the receptor, and this helix actually relaxes a bit and changes its conformation. And when this changes its conformation, that leads to a change on the inside here that causes it to release the, uh, the signal. And this, in turn, is caused by something binding up here. Uh, no, sadly, I don't have a movie. But what they showed is that you basically, from the active state up here, when you just remove the ligand, you move over the intermediate state and eventually all the way down to the inactive state. And this, the distance between two of the helices, helix six and helix three, to be exact. And in this case, this is the R miss D to the inactive state. And you can actually show how you move. You start from the active state, you go close to the intermediate state, and you end up in the inactive state. Although the only thing you actually use as input in the simulation is the active state. And then we can show that we end up pretty much overlapping the inactive crystal structure exactly. I'm not sure you see this, but the blue part here is the inactive crystal structure. The red is the active we're starting from. That helix in a completely different orientation, right? The computer does not see the blue structure. The computer doesn't know anything about the blue structure. All I do is that I will remove that compound, and then we let this simulate for roughly 20 microseconds. And eventually, this helix will fall in. And when you stop at the end, you're overlapping on the inactive structure. This is not something you would do in uh, drug development. The only reason for doing this is if you want to understand how the receptor activates. Why would you like to do that? So that, so that depends a bit on what you want to do, right? So there's a thing that I've been seeing. What is that we've been doing here all day? What is that we've been optimizing? What is that we've been developing? Yes, but how do we develop those drugs? 
What is that I try to do in docking? Yeah, simpler, but simpler than that. What is the first part when two molecules interact? When the small molecule, what is that the small molecule does to the large molecule? Binds. And that's a simple problem, right? We're optimizing binding, we're optimizing affinity. But was that really your goal? Right, we want to fix it, right? We wanted to, the, I could not care less whether it's, well, like, if I have a choice, a picomolar drug is better than a nonomolar drug. But that just tells you how hard it binds. If it doesn't have any effect, it's not even a drug. So what if you could have, maybe you could have a drug that's not quite as good at binding, nonomolar, but much better at creating the effect, right? In most cases, in particular, we have these classical drugs that, let's see. The classical drugs where you have an agonist that pretty much looks exactly like the original molecule, it activates the protein in the same way. Those two will usually correlate extremely well because actually we're, we're binding in the same place in roughly the same way. Of course, we're gonna have roughly the same effect per binding, right? But nothing says that has to be true. What if, in this case, if you wanted to stabilize this receptor in either the open or closed state, maybe I could create something that binds in a completely different site. If I wanted to stabilize that red helix in the active state, maybe I can have a compound that bound between those two helices. You're not gonna find that out in particular, you're not going to find that out by just docking to the active state, inactive state. You're going to need to dock to the active state. You're going to need to have a rough idea that, well, this helix 6 will move, and therefore I should try to dock something between helix 6 and helix 7, for instance. So the reason for studying mechanisms and everything is that you're not quite sure how you want to achieve something. And to achieve that, you need to understand how it works first. On Monday, so at this week, you're going to have labs today. No, on Thursday. Thursday, not today, right? No, today, today because you, did, sorry, you didn't have a lab yesterday. So you're going to have a lab today and on Thursday, and then we don't have a lecture on Friday because some of you were heading off to, uh, there was some day at SU related to something. I forgot what. It's here. It's not oh, sorry, it's, sorry, it's here. Anyway, since there's an open house day here or something, I already have a reserve time on Monday, so let's do the lecture on Monday instead because there's no point me sitting and there's no point me lecturing here why half of you are not here and the other half uh, is just missing things. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about there is how we try to do this on ion channels in particular because ion channel, we know that they can be either open or closed or there's some strange intermediate or desensitized states, but we don't really know how they move between them. And the second you start to real understand how they move between them, suddenly you realize that there are multiple binding sites that we can target. Can you try to stabilize one or the other? Because the second you stabilize something, that's going to be more favorable. Is there something else you can do rather than stabilize a favorable state? Destabilize the unfavorable state, right? Uh, so you can bind something or create something that suddenly makes it bad to be in the inactive state. That would also have the same effect. So that this is a very, even before you start thinking about what you're gonna bind where, there are lots of things you can do with these molecules. And you can always either have an agonist or you can have a, an allosteric modulator. In some cases you can have, uh, in some cases you might, it might actually work to uh, combine an inverse agonist and a modulator so that you turn off one type of behavior that you don't like, but you still wanna keep some other behavior that you do like. The final part of the equation is that even when you have one of these beautiful drugs, it will never ever hit just one receptor. Sorry, that's not how easy it is. Think about the GPCRs. There are like elite thirsty of them. They're very similar. If you find a drug that binds really well to a GPCR, let's say that you find a drug that binds very well to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, can you think of like 24 other molecules it will also bind very well to? Because if they're so similar, right, there's a very big risk that this would bind to other GPCRs. This is even worse for ion channels because most ion channels are even more similar than the GPCRs. So drugs that bind to one ion channel will almost certainly bind to another. Spider toxins works that way, for instance. Uh, a lot of these simple toxins that they will bind to a bunch of channels. So what do you do then? Yes, but how do you make something more specific? So the problem is that this is a complicated mathematical optimization problem, right? Um, I'm not sure how much optimization, you probably haven't studied optimization theory, but 
you've all studied analysis, I think. So if you, if you want to find what is the local minimum of, a, say, a local minimum of, of a function, that could be anything, say that, which is the cheapest way to get to Arlanda Airport? But you typically have either a boundary or side condition, like what is the cheapest way to get to Arlanda Airport in an environmentally friendly way that would exclude taxi or your own car? And it's the same thing here, so that you want a binding affinity that's as good as possible, but you'll probably also have Lipinski's rules of five, it can't be too heavy, blah, 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 it can't be too hydrophobic, it can't be too hydrophilic. Another side condition is simply, and this cannot bind well to a bunch of other receptors, yet you know. There are, there are some receptors that are quite promiscuous in the sense that they tend to, tend to bind lots of stuff. One of them is called HERG, uh, uh, H-E to a go, -go um, common receptor that leads to side, uh, very easily lead to side effects really, uh, that get problem with the arrhythmia or something. So you typically do anti-screening too, so that you want to screen things that you should hit something that you want, but then you also screen another 20 receptors that you will want to try to avoid hitting. And in that case, it's not just a matter of picking, then you don't want to pick the molecule that's best, but you want to pick the molecules that has the largest difference in binding. So you should have bind the one you want significantly better than the ones you don't want, and then try to optimize that difference in binding. And that comes down to this admetox, right? The toxicity and side effect administration is frequently way more complicated. And I would argue that a large part of drug design today is really this two-dimensional problem not just optimizing the binding affinity, but optimizing the binding affinity without going into bad things in admetox. Much harder than just the first part. You do more calculations, you do more screens. Uh, the admetox, I would argue, is still mostly experimental. Uh, on the screening thing, you can, um, if, you have, if you have crystal structures of 20 compounds and you want to bind to one of them but not the other 19, you can just, you can just do docking to all of them. So pick out the ones that get best scores for the good one you have, and then among those 1,000, check what are the scores to your other 19 receptors, and then rank them in a way so that you want the, rather than just ranking them for the best binding affinity, you try to rank them to have the largest difference. In toxicity, ultimately you have to go into animal models and show that it's not too toxic. And it actually turns out that animals too do this. You probably know of a bunch, there are a bunch of toxins that are usually based on proteins actually, but say, spiders, uh, scorpion, um, cobra toxin. What do these toxins do? Channels. They usually bind ion channels, yes, and they usually inhibit your ion channels. Do you see any problem with that? Why wouldn't they inhibit the animal channels? Sorry? They would sort of inhibit the... Animal. Right, so this is not good if you're a cobra. Or there are a bunch of these, there are these frogs in Amazons that are very, very poisonous. You just touch them, you can even die. Like if you were one of those frogs, that would basically mean that you wouldn't have any nerve signals, right? So it turns out that these frogs actually have small mutations in their channel to make, and they've basically accomplished the same thing by mutating their genes. So that this frog itself is probably a little bit sensitive to it, but not very sensitive. So it's very toxic to other species, but it's not toxic to the animal itself. Oh no, I think it's awesome because you get to travel to all these fun places in the world and work with uh, fun animals and everything. You accidentally touch the wrong thing in the world. Oh, yeah, there, are, there are far worse things that you work with in, a normal, in a norm, any normal hospital. Well, Jesus. <laughs> if you, Jesus, but Jesus, if you work with Ebola research, mm. like there are, there are, there are biosafety level four labs in Sweden. Uh, <laughs> my colleagues of us in Linköping actually. Actually, I don't, there is only a biosafety level three lab here in Stockholm. In Linköping, we have a level four lab insanely expensive to run. Um, but they're, they're a safety procedure, you can handle this. It's just that as a researcher, I don't, it's not the safety that concerns you because the safety is after, right? You're not gonna accept, well, 50% of my students die, but that's fine, I, I still get two degrees per year. The hard part is first, that how much it's gonna cost, the auditing, and second, that everything is so much slower. Because any experiment that you have to do in a bias at the level lab is gonna take 100 times longer than just doing it at the lab bench. So that's why, it might seem stupid, for instance, why, why are researchers so fond of bacteria, for instance? Why on earth do we study any binding in bacterial channels or something where we could do it in the fancy stuff? And that's because it's like it's a factor 10 cheaper at least and 100 times faster to do it in the bacterial stuff rather than having a biosafety lab or toxins or anything. So let's start with the simple stuff and then go to the complicated thing when we need it, not sooner. 
I think that's all I'm going to have to say. So we might finish 10 minutes earlier today. Uh, I'm just going to have, I'm going to be a bit nasty. I'm just going to have one study question on Monday. You're going to take me through this, how modern drug development works. And think about, in particular, some of these things. It's fun to be able to just repeat how a drug is developed, but how have we really improved the last 10 years? What are the challenges today and where might you be heading in the future? Because if you end up working in this, whether you work at the at SciLife Lab or at the university hospital or at a pharmaceutical company, it's very likely that you're going to be stumbling into this. At SciLife Lab, we have a facility for drug development. And what they're going to ask you, even if you're not, you might not at all be interested in working at that facility, right? You're a cancer researcher. But if you're a cancer researcher, what's your goal? Well, you want to find a cure or a drug, right? And at some point, you might... What's your strategy going to be to find that drug? You will need to find a receptor. You will need to find a target first. You're going to need to find, to actually do anything on that target, you would somehow need to find something that binds to that target, even if you're not going to do any of the docking yourself. Those fundamental concepts you have to understand, otherwise you're never going to be able to do anything useful. You're also going to need to realize at some point, you can't have the heaven and say that you would like to do it. At some point, unless you have an infinite amount of money, you're likely going to have to limit yourself to some library of pre-existing things. And if they now give you 10 good things back, what could you do to improve this? So think a bit, even if you're not going to be writing the docking codes yourself, um, as a user of this, you need to have a rough idea of roughly how this works. Ooh, let me see if I, so the problem, let me see if I can find a good overview or a review article. Um, so one problem is, of course, that this is a field that changes very rapidly, right? Uh, and one important reason why this is changing is that the old way of doing drugs is not just that it died out, like not becoming popular. The reason, why did the old way of developing drug becoming popular? Yes, we're just spending money, we're not getting drugs, right? It doesn't work. And again, these companies are not into welfare. And you can see this from two points of view. Again, they're, again, they're, these companies, I think all the large companies spend more on marketing than they spend on actual research. So I can't say that I feel too sorry of them for being hung out to dry occasionally. But on the other hand, if you, you can look at this from a different point of view. Um, antibiotics. What's the problem with antibiotics? Yes. Uh, well, like, no, that's not quite true. We do develop new ones occasionally. But the problem with antibiotics is that bacterial strains get resistant to them and they get resistant very quickly. So what if, assuming that you now come up with a really new smart antibiotic tomorrow? Because they're all encouraging us to do this. We need more antibiotics, right? And your pharmaceutical company comes out with an amazing new antibiotic. It took you 10 years, you spent half a billion dollars on this. Well, one of two things will happen. Either everybody starts prescribing this right away, and within 12 months, the bacteria will be resistant to your drug too. Sorry, you just lost half a billion dollars. Many people only take it for a week. Yes, but that's a separate issue. The point, from your point of view, is that this might sound harsh, but ultimately, if you want to work with companies, you have to understand why a company exists. A company exists to make money for its stockholders. We might not like that, but this money is ultimately your retirement accounts. <laughs> Uh, and you probably want some retirement benefits eventually. The other alternative is that we are super restrictive. We're going to make sure that the bacteria strain don't become resistant to this drug. And then the government will say, sorry, nobody can prescribe you. It's only like the 1% worst cases you can prescribe this antibiotic and send it for $10 per bottle. You just lost half a billion there too. So that if we want the company, if we want private companies to invest their money in making antibiotics, there has to be some sort of perspective where they can make money from it. If we don't accept that, we're going to need to fund it with the taxpayers' money. And I would argue that's partly the problem with antibiotics. There is no business model for it. Now, on the other hand, making, say, Lipeter for somewhat overweight Westerners, that's money, $150 billion. So while we might certainly fault the companies for doing this, remember who set these rules? We did. It's not a coincidence they go after Lipeter rather than antibiotics. Same thing with malaria. Malaria is a horrible disease, one of the worst diseases in the world. But the average person suffering from malaria, how much can they pay for a drug? Nothing. It's not an important disease in New York or Stockholm or Berlin or anywhere. Um, and again, that's as bad as the companies are and we fault the companies for not investing it. We're not investing either. 
well, there's a tiny amount of taxpayers' money going to, particularly Karolinska, which I actually like. But overall in the world, we're not investing any money in this. So remember that we're part of the equation. It's not as easy as it's just the bad pharmaceutical companies. Good. I'll stop there. Do you have any questions? <laughs>